proceed to order. One of our new trustees is welcome. And um, the first item on the agenda is roll call. And we have um, four of our five trustees here today. Regina is not here. Um, and then the next thing on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. Do we have a flag? Right. right. Oh, good. OK, the flag is up here. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, um, I was going to talk a little bit about meeting procedures, but I particularly wanted to, um, I particularly wanted to um, have our new trustees, I'm sorry, I am talking in the microphone. Um, I prefer to have here. It's turned up, but it's already making static. So the louder we turn it, the more static there is right now. So um, uh, I was going to go over some meeting procedures, but I will wait until our, do we have an idea for other new trustees? I a message. Okay, so I will, put, I will um, go ahead and um, do those meeting procedures later and we'll start with public comments. Let me my notes. And that list has been submitted. I haven't gotten a list yet, but I will. I'm sorry. It's right oh, it's right next to me. Yes, yes I've gotten a list. Yes. Okay. Um, hang on a minute. All right. Welcome to the Community Library Network Board of Trustees meeting um, that is open to the public. As we have done for years, we are taking our meetings out to these smaller libraries. And the purpose is to give board members a chance to see these libraries and their communities and to allow managers to show off their libraries. Um, we are meeting when these libraries are closed in order to accommodate as much public as possible. We are also um, limiting our public comment time to 30 minutes starting when the first person's starts speaking um, at, in order to in order to for us to be able to complete our work and also to that end we've added 30 minutes to our meeting um, and i'm now going to talk a little bit from the public comment policy the community library network board of trustees operates under the idaho code open meeting law the board will be pleased to take comments under advisement although they will, we will not be responding at this meeting. When addressing the board, please sign in before speaking, which I have the list here with your community. We ask you to give your community so that we are aware, because we have several, seven communities. Um, comments should be addressed, addressed directly to the board and not to the audience. A limit of three minutes is allowed for each speaker. A person may speak at the podium only once. In cases of disagreement, the speaker must use grace and tact. Persons addressing the board are expected to observe a level of uh, civility and decorum appropriate for a public meeting. No personal attacks or disruptions from the audience will be tolerated. <laughs> and I may ask you to um, redirect or terminate your your presentation should it get um you know not to follow if it's not following these guidelines um so i think that with that um the first speak up speaker um on our agenda is jacob where My name is Jacob. I'm a librarian here at Spirit Lake. I worked for the Community Library Network for nearly 10 years. While on the job, I've tried to remain apolitical. During this last election cycle, this has been a challenge as we were subjected to a campaign of defamation and insult. Now, 
I'm off the clock, so I'm speaking my mind and set the record straight regarding several broad accusations. We are not purging classics from our collection. Twain, Kipling, Alcott, and Clary are all still here. The American Library Association principles are time tested and designed to prevent censorship or manipulation by anyone. The presidency of the American Library Association is irrelevant to our library operations. We have never held a drag queen story hour, and we are not grooming children. Parents have always been welcome to supervise youth events, and we are not hiding anything from them. Our books are not pornographic. According to the Cornell Law School's legal dictionary, pornography, quote, depicts nudity or sexual acts for the purpose of sexual stimulation, unquote. That does not describe anything I have ever seen here, much less in the children's section. As for obscenity, there is no solid definition. However, again from Cornell, a work investigated for obscenity must be considered in its entirety and not merely judged on its parts. Finding something distasteful is not grounds for proclaiming it obscene, pornographic, or without literary merit. Protect the children is a good principle. That is why authoritarians use it to justify political agendas from gun control to library censorship. Freedom of inquiry is essential to a free society, and free people make up their own minds while respecting the rights of others to do the same. We serve a diverse population, including churchgoers, homeschoolers, and homesteaders. People across the religious, political, and gender identity spectrum use our collection. The library is for everyone. Not every book is for everyone, but every book is for someone. If you come here looking for something to find offensive, you will probably succeed, but that says far more about you and your motivations than it does about the library. I have no faith in those who so dishonorably bore false witness against their neighbors for weeks. These tall oaths you are about to swear will ring hollow. How will the board work to repair this rift torn in our community and restore lost trust? You can never undo the stress we have suffered or replace the sleep we have lost, but you can apologize as widely and loudly as we were previously defamed and educate the public instead of continuing to deceive them. Otherwise, you dishonor yourselves in word and deed. Thank you. Thank you. John. That's all I have is a John. Earlier this week, uh, the Biden administration had on the White House lawn a pride event where a uh, biological male with uh, artificial breasts went topless for a TikTok video. And I was very happy that shortly after this event, the White House condemned this action and said that it was inappropriate. And this is important in this context because uh, I don't think a lot of people would accuse President Biden or the Biden administration of being transphobic. So there'd be an understanding that this is a context issue and the White House lawn is not the place. Uh, it's uh, also not the place for something that I think is uh, equally sacred to the White House lawn, which is my four children. So uh, we've already heard just uh, just at the very beginning of this meeting that the library is not grooming children. Uh, I don't care if people want to have uh, drag shows. I don't care if adults choose um, uh, transgender surgeries. Uh, I don't care if people make pornographic movies, and I don't care if people want to watch those movies on the internet if they're adults. I do care if the library has a book that is specifically targeted to youth that calls porn a fun sugary treat, recommends that children, children, it's in the book, uh, visit the um, internet and look for, search for the uh, interviews with their fave uh, porn actors and see what porn websites those actors recommend and visit those. Uh, the book may be, by certain academic definitions, not itself pornographic, but it's unequivocal that it's recommending pornography and it's recommending the pornography to children. And uh, 
I'm looking forward to uh, this new uh, library group of trustees uh, answering the question of why. Why do we have that? Thank you. Mariana, Co Mariana Cochran. Morning. Hist quote, history will judge us by the difference we make in the everyday lives of children, unquote. Not my words, but Nelson <laughs> Mandela's. Today is replete with the joyful anticipation of prospective changes for kids and the glimmer of improvements on the horizon for our cherished community library network. But change can be unsettling to some because it's human nature to be wary of the unknown. So to help those who may be unsure or concerned, Following are several quotes and pithy insights by prominent, lauded, and often revered public figures. Quote, stepping onto a brand new path is difficult, but not more difficult than remaining in a situation which is not nurturing. Maya Angelou. Quote, the greatest discovery of all time is that a person can change his future by merely changing his attitude. End quote, by Oprah Winfrey. In light of Ms. Winfrey's popularity and her highly awarded prolific body of work, perhaps those who subscribe to her ideologies could also adopt her recommendation to have a change of heart about impending revisions and look for the good in them. After all, these modifications will be to protect and support the most precious and the most vulnerable among us. Quote, I am optimistic in the long run. A great man once said the true symbol of the United States is not the bald eagle, it's the pendulum. And when the pendulum swings too far in one direction, it will go back. Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Quote, the price of doing the same old thing is far higher than the price of change. Unquote. Bill Clinton. Quote, change takes courage. Unquote. By Ocasio-Cortez. Quote, change is never easy, but always possible. Change will not come if we wait for some other person or some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for, Barack Hussein Obama. This board and Kootenai County have heard enough from me. I hope the aforementioned closing words I've shared today can act as a healing salve and a celebratory primer for CLN's new era in making positive change in the lives of local children. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Catherine, oh, I hate that I can't read this. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> is this what? 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 What is your name? Uh, Catherine Alibi. I think that that is not not the Catherine I've got. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Usually, you can't say. Is it Kathleen? It, Kathleen. Yeah, Kathleen. Okay. It is Kathleen. I'm That's so sorry, Kathleen. That's okay. They never can say my name. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. My name is Kathleen Workman Gistich. I worked for the Community Library Network for 17 years, first as the children's librarian here for many years, and then as the branch manager for nine years. I have to say that I'm shocked and dismayed at the audacity of this current trend towards censoring, banning, or otherwise limiting access to reading material in a public library. Emphasis on public. This library and every library under the heading of public is not Christian, not Muslim, not Mormon, not Jewish, not heterosexual, not male, not female. The word specifies its constituents, a broad, diverse community just with that one word, public. This is in holding with separation of state and religious affiliation, which always has been in this country and remains a constitutional right. Our government is a federal democratic republic. 
Even a library board cannot dictate policy that goes against this fundamental protective right. As for the protection of children, it is every parent's right to oversee what their children read, which puts the responsibility squarely on their shoulders to be with their child at the library. It is also every parent's responsibility to guide their child to enter into a public world where the child must learn about other views, other cultures, other ways of living in order to live alongside each other and not create anarchy. Thankfully, we live in a diverse country. There's not just one religion, one political viewpoint, one way of loving another human being. One of the precepts of libraries going back to ancient times is information and education. Libraries were repositories for all the knowledge that was available. However, it was available only to scholars. Fortunately, information is available to everyone today. Learning about all people and ways of living and learning the history of the mistakes made in the past are imperative for our future survival. In this modern day, we cannot go back to banning books, limiting knowledge, or deciding belief systems for others. I believe the library is a wholesome place, and I'm personally offended that any member of this board believes that children in Storytime or any of the children's programs in the Community Library Network has been introduced to vice and immorality. This does not happen. The district has wonderful, talented people putting together science, technology, engineering, art, and math programs called STEAM for the entire district. Kathleen. Okay, I'm just gonna say, attend a children's program and find out for yourself. Thank you very much. Okay, Barbara, once again, I can't read the last. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. Good morning, my name is Barbara Broughton. I've worked almost 17 years for Community Library Network, including five years as manager for Spirit Lake Library and eight years for Athel. I am deeply concerned about the future direction of this library district. Trustees are not above the law. If they want to challenge any books or materials, as a taxpayer and library patron, I demand that they follow the same procedures just like any other citizen. That means filling out the two-page library form for every single item. It is then the director's task to make a decision based on sound library principles. If these steps are not followed, then it clearly means censorship and book banning. A public library can and should not cater to an individual or a small group with an agenda of their own. A public library is there for everyone and should have as diverse a collection as there are diverse people in this country. Libraries and librarians have an obligation to resist efforts that systematically exclude materials dealing with any subject matter, including religion, sex, gender, identity, or sexual orientation. If you can't be impartial, you certainly do not belong on a library board as trustee. The word trustee comes from trust. How can I trust that you will not try and destroy the publicness, the diversity, or the all-inclusiveness of this library district? According to your own words, it is your mission to reform the library system so that it conforms to Christian norms that violates the rights of everyone who has different beliefs and perspectives. To cite Christian morality and make that the measuring stick of what should be in a public library violates the separation of state and church. To demand that libraries adhere to the Ten Commandments and adopt Christian morality is therefore in direct conflict with the Constitution. The purpose of the First Amendment was to prevent one religion to be established over another. There are many different religions in our country and many non-Christian people live here. But that only means that no single morality code other than the laws of the United States of America itself can be considered. Public libraries are funded by taxpayers' money. As a taxpayer, I have the right to fully expect a diverse collection and diverse programming in any of the public libraries in Kootenai County. If that can no longer be guaranteed, there is just a small step to the establishment of a morality police. Look what happens in Iran and Afghanistan. I am a first generation immigrant from Germany. All through my years at school and universities, our teachers over and over again reminded us that it's our and the next generation's task to make absolutely sure that never ever can things that led up to the Second World War happen again. 
and what led up to it where restriction of information, disinformation and misinformation, banning of books and artworks, burning of books and smashing and slashing of artworks, especially those written and created by so-called others, Jews, gypsies, and in the end, there's people who look differently, had a different lifestyle, or just plain did not agree with the regime. I never dreamt that in my 72nd year, I would be called upon to defend freedom of speech and information, but there I am in the United States of America. Thank you. Um, Megan, Megan, Alaka? Alcala. Alcala, sorry. Uh, I'm not doing well today. <laughs> Good morning, my name is Megan Alcala. Um, I previously worked as the youth librarian here at Spirit Lake. Um, and I just would like to say that I'm looking forward to the new members bridging that gap of knowledge that they have and learning what the library is truly for. I think that perhaps they've forgotten or have never known that the library is a place of neutrality. The, those of us that work for the library, we are here in a neutral position. We're here to help you find the information that you seek. We are not here to censor anything. Um, I think that that job, everyone needs to take on a little bit more personal responsibility in their own lives and with their children. Um, I challenge anyone to find a single family that I have served that had a problem with anything, a book I have read, a program that I presented. Uh, I, too, like several people have said, take great offense to people thinking that I provide anything as awful as you all have mentioned here at some of these meetings to your children. Um, so again, I look forward to you guys gaining some more knowledge and learning what the library is for and what your role as a trustee is. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, Catherine Alapi. 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 Okay. <laughs> Even. <laughs> thank you for coming back. Oh, sorry about that. This one, right? Okay. <laughs> So, hi, my name is Catherine Alfie. I spent a quarter of my life working in this branch, and it was such an experience because I serve my community. You don't work in the library to get rich. You don't work in the library to, you know, become some big presence in your community. But you know what happens? You do become a presence in your community. You get hailed at the gas station. Hey, I'll get those books in. And you're like, no, no, I'm off the clock. It's cool. Um, what really saddens me about all this is board reports used to be boring. These monthly board meetings, there never used to be a human here other than the board and the manager giving the report. We used to have to liven them up a little bit, me and my coworkers, because that's just it. This is a community and it breaks my heart that the community is being tore apart because of the bad things going on in the world. If there are bad things going on in the world, you get together with your community and you see what your community actually does for it. I taught children's programmings and I've been called a groomer. I homeschooled my kids because I cared about the world. The library was not the place where grooming was happening. I'm cool that you want to be concerned about it. I really am. And you know what? Work together with people to make it better, but don't tear apart your community because you're worried about things that you watch on TV or read on the internet. Go talk to your community. And I really have a lot of hope with this change. I want to thank everybody who, you know, slandered and libeled people we're doing it because you know what's going to happen we're going to get together and we're going to actually see what was done because the library is a freaking awesome place guys we had hundreds of people come through here i did adult programming i did children's programming and i have been gone since 2021 because i'm a farm a local farmer and it breaks my heart to see what has been said about these fine people right here they're awesome so i hope that for the future we get together and we actually work on these problems and listen to each other instead of tearing each other apart thank you Thank you. Noel Ferris. No, no. 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 I did. I said that one. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> Uh, defending freedom of speech in the First Amendment is easy when you agree with what's being said. 
defending it when you find what's being said distasteful or abhorrent is not. That's when it's necessary. That's when it's important. That's when it matters the most. I believe that we can all agree that protecting our children from the evils and the nastiness of this world is paramount. Things that don't, these, those things don't go away just because we lock them behind glass and steel. If we think that hiding things is going to be the end all, we seriously underestimate the craftiness of children. Well, yes, there is bad in the world, things we don't want our kids to be exposed to, uh, but imagine a world where our children are in fear of words, are afraid of speaking. This will not stop. There's always the next thing to hide away. What will we do when the canons of censorship are pointed at the words we do like and no one is willing to stand to prevent it? The urge to save humanity is almost always a false front for the desire to rule it. From Angel Mencken. Thank you. Thank you. Anita Dupchek. Anita Dupsek, Rathrums. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman Blank, Director, Assistant Director Eccles, and if Director or uh, Director Eccles and Director, Assistant Director um, Lindsay, um, and board members. In 1 Timothy 2, we are to asked to pray for all who are in authority so that we may live quiet, peaceable lives marked by godliness and reverence. For the past two years, this board has been and will continue to be prayed for, lifted up. We ask the Lord to reveal himself to each one of you, to pr protect you and your families, to expose any areas of inconsistency in your thinking, and to grant you wisdom. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Summer Bushnell. just wanted to say that as a community member and I was part of the push to get the new trustee then I've never had an issue with any library employees mine has been directed at maybe the library director but more at the elected officials just to make that clear I think there's a lot of residents that have no problem with the employees of the library and I'm just excited to see this new change and to see what happens and I think we can probably all come together and agree on things from here thank you Thank you. Um, Ann Goff. I've been looking at the books in my library, and as an educator, I am concerned. During the first few months of life, our brains wire to the sounds of the language around us. If the only language we hear is English, we will have to work very hard as adults to develop the ability to hear the sounds of French or Greek. Similarly, if we raise children only on the shallowest of books and the simplest of language structures, we set them up for very hard work in the future to learn the foreign language of complexity and nuance. It is a wonderful thing for each generation to have their own Hardy Boys or Harry Potter, but we must not neglect to also introduce these readers to the rich history and beautiful melody of the great books. We do not want to be guilty of telling children that the great books aren't for them, that if the authors didn't look like them, that means they didn't write for them. Yet somehow this is exactly what I see in the children's section of my local library. Sprinkled among the bright modern books, there are a tiny handful of books labeled classic. One of these classics is a 2009 book written in the tradition of the 1924 classic Winnie the Pooh. The rest were almost entirely children's versions of classics, and in this case, children's version means entirely rewritten and drained of all nuance and life. You can't handle the great books, or they aren't worth reading anyway, is not the message we should be sending children. Depriving children in their formative years of books with depth of characterization, nuance of plot, and complexity of language does not prepare them to tackle those books later. Literature is the memory of a culture, 
It weaves a conversation across generations. The great books have a profound and immeasurable impact on countries and individuals alike. The books that have stood the test of time shape who we are and how we understand the world. It is vitally important that our libraries work with parents to share this memory with children, to bring children into this conversation, not to discourage children from reading these books and tell them that this conversation is closed to them. I teach language and I have taught to all age levels, preschool through adult. Our children need to be introduced to the beauty of language, the delight of a well-crafted argument, the wonder of a story that enchanted their parents and their grandparents before them. Please bring more great books into the libraries, into the children's section and the young adult section and give them pride of place. Highlight them as the wonders that they are so that they are easily found and enjoyed by a new generation of readers. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll call the next person and we can look at our list. Um, <clears throat> Walt Maurer. Good morning, Walt Maurer Corlang. 50 years ago, when I was a young teenager in North Dakota, pornography, I can't even say that word, porn magazines sold in stores such as Playboy and Penthouse were required to be covered with paper wrappers to shield young eyes from everything except the titles. And of course, such magazines could only be sold to adults. 25 years ago, when I was a young father in California, I observed that a local convenience store owner was violating an ordinance by displaying his porn magazines without covers. The response of the local authorities was not to enforce their ordinance, but instead to tell me that young people could see more skin on the California beaches, so why worry about them seeing the entire cover of porn magazines? Last month, upon receiving much campaign mail about the library trustee election, I finally visited Clean Books for Kids website to see what all the fuss was about and was shocked, shocked to see what children of any age currently have access to because of the policies you have put into place. I then stepped into a nearby library where the first thing I saw was a very large bookcase plastered from top to bottom with signs proclaiming adult graphic novels. Because I thought that adult means someone over the age of 18, I naively assumed that this bookcase is located only 20 feet away from the librarian's desk to prevent access by minors. But I was wrong. The librarian told me that the bookcase is located there to prevent theft, but that its contents may be viewed by 10-year-olds or 5-year-olds or anyone of any age. So what sort of content may an impressionable youngster of any age read in your libraries? Here are two excerpts from a pornographically illustrated book. Quote, reproduction aside, your genitals exist to let you feel pleasure with yourself or others, no matter what genitals they may have. Sexual intimacy is a powerful way to feel good and bond with another person, whether it's for a night or a lifetime. Quote, the online world is full of pornography, professionals and amateurs alike sharing their sexy adventures online. When consumed right, porn can help you discover new aspects of your sexuality and help you safely explore kinks and fantasies, unquote. So in conclusion, I and many others look forward to your pending work to protect Kootenai County's children from clearly age inappropriate content. I'll leave you with this quote from the good book. Quote, if anyone causes any of these little ones to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Unquote. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask our board. I'm going to ask our board. We have two more speakers. Shall we just go ahead and let our list finish? Is that acceptable to you? Okay. Um, so then, well, well, we're going to have two more speakers. Um, the, there's one on this list, and then you had another one. Okay. Um, Roger Dunham. Sure. sure. <laughs> I'm trying to get the Epic the Epoch Times uh, in the library as a collect part of the collection um, for a couple of years and uh, have not met with uh, success, but uh, we'll continue to try. I, I feel that uh, since your mission statement is to empower discovery, uh, there's a great member of, number of us that feel 
misrepresented by the fact that you have the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal for the general reference. Uh, we feel a whole part of the story is not covered in, uh, in terms of uh, uh, journalistic uh, quality and unbiased uh, presentation. And uh, the Epoch Times uh, has been, uh, for the last three years, it's been very, uh, uh, it would cover all the news, not just those selected by the mainstream media or the mainstream publications. Uh, and I'd like to get that uh, for the library collection if possible since uh, we really do want to empower discovery and you can't discover something if there's only one side of the story being presented. Uh, uh, you know, whatever I need to go through to present that again to the library board to uh, try again. I have the, 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 there were very select fact checkers that were uh, not, uh, not biased. I, I mean, not unbiased. Uh, and so that was one of the reasons they, uh, said that the Epoch Times wasn't uh, the quality, and uh, I, I tend to disagree. But thank you. Thank you. And then you have Ben. I I don't know his name. Can you give us your name? For, I don't have it written on my list. I would be happy to. I am Representative Tony Bishnevsky from District Five. I have now served three terms in the Idaho legislature, and I wasn't going to speak this morning. I came to witness the swearing in of the new trustees. Um, I have a couple of comments that I'd like to make. First of all, I'd like to dispel some of the misconceptions that have been presented at this meeting and others as well. First of all, I've heard many, many people, not just here, but at the Capitol and in the Education Committee, on which I served, where we had these hearings on the library bill, quote, I have never seen any of these materials that have been talked about. With a raise of hands, would you please raise your hand if you have seen a baby pigeon? Um, okay. I'm sorry, what, our, our policies ask that you address the board and not the Thank audience. You. Thank you. If you've never seen a baby pigeon, that isn't because it doesn't exist. They're there, it's a fact of life. You can't have adult pigeons without it. So just because people have not seen it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. The constitutional right, so-called right of separation of church and state, there is no such constitutional right that has been repeated over and over again. We talk about censorship. We're not talking about censorship here. We're talking about keeping inappropriate material away from children, period, end of story. Everything else that's been discussed in this and many other meetings is immaterial. We want to keep this material away from the children. It's inappropriate. Uh, next, uh, it was stated this morning that we're catering to a small group of people. In the legislature, we attempted several uh, uh, tries at strengthening the existing law, which is Idaho Code 1815-15 or 1515, which you can look up. It is state law now. Everybody has to abide by it. In 1972, when the law was first passed, it was uh, given an affirmative defense to libraries and museums to not apply that law. But back in 1972, we were in the Leave it to Beaver and Father Knows Best era. Nobody anticipated this kind of pornography being available to children. Okay, mm -hmm. it's a totally different world. So we're cleaning up the laws to make it pertinent to today's culture. Uh, now, as far as a small group of people, 46 out of 70 members of the House of uh, Representatives voted to override the governor's veto. That is a 65% majority. That's one vote short of a super majority. That is not a small group of people. Those legislators, those members of the House were elected in every one of the 35 legislative districts throughout the state that represent 1 million voters throughout the state. This is not a small group of people that are trying to push reform of the library system. Okay, thank you. That's three thank minutes. You. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for everyone who spoke. Um, we are now going to, I'm going to go back to, since both our new trustee elects are here, I'm going to go back and talk about meeting procedures. Um, there's just a few things I want to mention today. Um, much of the format of our meetings is established by Idaho Code, and 
um, by our bylaws. The um, Idaho Code is according to the open meeting law. And so the only things that we'll be discussing at our meetings are the things that are on the agenda. Um, these, these are, this isn't all of the law. I, these are just the things I wanna help remind us for today. Um, our bylaws are also um, uh, laws that we adhere to. And our bylaws say that we will use Robert's rules of order and those are, and we are also allowed to use the rules for more, there's a few more relaxed rules for small boards and we are allowed to use, we are allowed to use those. We actually only use a couple of them. We can start a discussion before a motion is made. Um, we only make motions on things on the agenda that are labeled action items and we have, had a problem with that before we have, if we've neglected to, if we've made an error and we've done it, um, where we don't label a thing action item, then we are not, we do not vote on them. We don't make motions only on the things that we are labeled action items. Um, <clears throat> there are other things that we can use as uh, the more relaxed rules for small boards, but we haven't ever used them. Um, one is that the chair can make, make a motion. I have been on this board for forever and the chair, we, the chair has never used that. Um, um, also, uh, the, um, I, the chair can also vote on all motions and, and that, that's also a rule for small boards. And that, <clears throat> that is also something that this board has never used. The chair votes when I, when there's a tie to break. Um, so, um, in addition to that, uh, concerning discussion, Robert's Rules of Order is pretty clear on this. Nobody speaks a second time until everybody has had a chance to speak once. And we've gotten used to that. It's an it's a little it feels a little bit awkward during discussion, but we've gotten used to it. That keeps people from asking one board member a question and then, then the other board member answering, and then that going back and forth. And then there's nobody people don't know how to jump in. So we we everybody speaks once, then everybody can speak again, and we continue to go around until we're we're done with discussion. So um, it's not that people are going to be silenced. We just want to make sure that everybody's heard. So those are the only things that I have to say concerning meeting mm -hmm. procedures. Um, the next item on the agenda is um, actually. Oh, I'm sorry. I was wondering if um, if we could move something on the agenda um, because the the person uh, county treasurer or the person who's going to be nominated is not able to be here yet until eleven. Can we move that down? Uh, no, I, 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 the, the person who submitted the, um, the candidacy for treasurer is not here, not able to be here. And I received an email this morning um, and I sent direction and to, you know, uh, it was Vanessa said this and she apparently um, is helping her mother because after a surgery and I said mothers take precedent <laughs> over board meetings. And so I said, I don't feel that there was a need for her to be here. You know that she I, is right here. Oh, she's she's, she's in, in a team. Oh, she, oh, she's oh, okay. She's, she's online here in the meeting. Online. Okay, so, well, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> and I have to say she was very relieved that she didn't have to make that that trip because right. it would have been a quite a trip. Oh my gosh, yes. yes. And being a mother, mothers come first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Does that work, Rochelle? Okay. Yeah, I just was wondering. All righty. Um. Okay, so then the next item on the agenda is recognition of um, of trustees. But first of all, I would like to call some attention to our staff. We now I would like to welcome our new director, Alexa Exel Eccles. Thank you so much. She has she was came on July or on June fifth, and I would say she hit the ground running at one hundred and ten. Mm -hmm. We are really lucky to uh, one hundred and ten miles an hour. Uh, it, we are really lucky to have her. And I also, once again, would like to thank Lindsay for all of the work that she did, incredible work that she did as our interim, interim director. We couldn't have asked for more. Thank <laughs> you. Um, and to our changing board, I would first like to welcome our two new trustees. I'm, I'm sorry, I missed you. I had to sit down. I wanted to shake both your hands. Welcome to both of you. And we will be, um, we will be, you'll be joining us at the table in just a minute. Um, but before that, I want to also thank 
out, thank our outgoing board members. Um, Regina McCree is has chosen to be in Europe today instead of being with us. Um, and Michelle Veely was not able to come. She is our treasurer who has chosen not not to continue on. But Judy's here, um, and uh, Judy Meyer is here. And would you like to say a few things, Judy? Have you ever known me not to? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kate, you said some things I was going to say. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my welcome to Alexa and our new board members. Uh, and a couple observations. Alexa, you will find a marvelous staff and library system to which you bring great experience to help us grow even more. And congratulations, Kim and Tom. You too will experience a place that is our goal and vision describes, empower discovery, and is your go-to place for enrichment, engagement, and enjoyment. As you described, uh, Katie Regina is out of town, and we want to wish you well as you develop policy to continue these missions and goals. In the 80s, as the district grew, the board decided to take the library to the taxpayers by building satellite branches, as we're experiencing today, around the county, rather than build one large central facility. For those of you who know the Greek that we heard earlier, reference to Greek language, the Oedipus complex, we described it as the Oedipus complex. The bookmobile, and with the addition of the Discovery Bus, provides outreach to all areas of the county and our neighboring branch, in Shoshone. Now with the power of the internet, taxpayers have access to the library 24 seven and can go to the library in their jammies. None of these facilities and services would be possible or as effective as they are without the remarkable heads and hearts of our hardworking staff. And you already thank Lindsay, but um, no reason not to thank you many more times and all your team for helping us bridge the gap till we welcome Alexa. And I think we heard today that the public is ready for us to come together. And certainly that's something that, that uh, Regina and I believe in and would want to be sure to welcome with and would, uh, work with Tim and Tom on that. <clears throat> Over the last several years, we've developed a new strategic plan and hired a consultant to review our salary schedules. As you work on the budget, I would highlight to you the need to re-increase the staff salaries. So that now we only retain our current fine team, but we provide competitive employment opportunities for others. I'm sure as you reach over the branch, read over the branch and youth services reports, you discovered all the amazing, creative, and collaborative projects happening each month. Please count on Regina and me to share ideas and support this board as you puzzle through setting wise, constructive policy to continue to provide the most cost-effective place for enrichment, engagement, and enjoyment. Welcome aboard. <laughs> Judy, Judy, thank you very much. Um, it is sad for me to see you go. I have, we both have worked, we have worked <laughs> together most of our adult lives in community service. Since the last century. Judy. Yeah, <laughs> since the last century. Um, and I really appreciate you being here today. All right, with that, the next um, item on the agenda is the swearing in of the elected mm -hmm. trustees and we have oath, we have oaths, okay. And what I will do is I'll have, I will stand with you and the three of us will read the oath together. Thank you. Want them to come up there, Katie? Come right here. Yeah, they can okay. stand there. They'll, they'll be seated at, you'll be, and then you'll be seated at the table yep. as soon as. <laughs> can I have you stand, both stand and read with me? Can I have you stand and read with me? Okay. I do solemnly swear um, that I will support the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the State of Idaho, and that I will faithfully discharge the duties of library trustee according to the best of my ability. Thank you very much. And you are welcome to, Judy, would you like to trade places? Oh, thanks for that. Big print. <laughs> <laughs> and you're getting your official badges from Alexa.
Okay, the next item on the agenda is the nominating committee report. And just so that, um, well, let me say this, welcome to both of you. Thank you. Um, the nominating committee report and at last month's meeting, according to our by as according to our bylaws, I appointed a committee, a nominating committee, which consisted of Judy, who has uh, been the previous nominating committee, but we were aware that that our board meeting happened after the election. So then I also um, asked Vanessa to participate on that committee and they worked together. And now I will let Vanessa give her report. Um, oh, let me let me also say um, the next two items after this are election of officers and the appointment of the treasurer. It, it, we are do, dividing these positions up. Um, and so the officers that we will be electing are chairperson and vice chairperson because in Idaho code, it says that the board appoints the treasurer and clerk. So we'll do it in two sections, but Vanessa, you can give your whole report on all, all, all positions. Okay. Thank you, Katie. Okay, um, I will be representing the nominating committee, which is made up of Judy Meyer and myself. Um, Judy and I had several meetings, as well as me meeting with each trustee and trustee elect. Uh, it was a pleasure to meet with each person and get their opinions on the slate. I was very pleased to find that we all are on close agreement about the outcome. Each person agreed that which so, with so much change happening at the CLN, it would be a prudent move to keep as much leadership in place as possible. Um, that's that I was very pleasantly surprised with that from everybody. Um, with that said, I can now give the officer slate. Um, chair would be Katie Blank and Vice Chair Rochelle Otteson. And would you like me to give the treasurer and yeah. clerk as well? Mm -hmm. uh, treasurer Julie Sad, S A A D, uh, and Clerk Tim Floss. I believe it's like Floss. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and we did. Um, and Julie's here. <laughs> I see her face. OK, and I think. Um, uh, mama, mama, uh, resume. Uh, yeah, everybody. Yeah, did it, Julie's um, resume and bio. I did. It came I in there. Do you have a printout if you. It, it was email. email. Oh, I didn't look at the email. OK, um, this is actually this is her um, bio. Resume, and she is on Lindsay's computer <laughs> presently. So, so, but okay. So the next item will be the election of the uh, chair and vice. Actually, chair. I would like to nominate um, vice chair. Well, how do we go about doing this? As far as we should we just, just yeah, yeah, okay, do yes. it, okay. Turn off and then. Yeah. Okay. Procedurally, I mean, do we just discuss whether we agree with the slate? Yes. This is even a yes. Way to talk right now, just to make sure I get the norms to swing of them with the, with the meeting. Um, uh, you know, it was a slate based upon the fact we were told. Um, I think it was. Uh, I was thinking in terms of uh, Rochelle, and then I was told, well, she was not interested necessarily in being the chair, and so I don't think it would be appropriate for myself just jumping in here the first day and being a chair. Probably not for Tim as well. So it's to depend upon. Whether Rochelle really doesn't want to be chair because a lot of different people on the board now. I guess what I would ask you is that is that what you're saying? I think what we're looking at is the slate at this point in time. Are you saying that you don't want to be part of that slate any longer? Um. Well, I don't want to be chair, um, but the voters have asked for a change in direction. So I would entertain that. You'd entertain what? Being chair? Uh, yes, if that's what Tom was saying. That's Tom was saying. Okay, do you want to do vote on the slate? And the, right, the, I, would, I would entertain a motion to, to, I would entertain a motion for, you know, to, to look at the slate first from the nominating committee. Okay, I move that we um, accept the officer slate that was from presented. the nominating committee. OK, it's been moved to accept the officer's slate from the nominating committee. Um, is there now discussion on that? Which we've had some. 
Yes, if it's over for discussion, again, I was I was in, led to believe by Vanessa that Rochelle is probably not interested in being the, uh, the chair. And if that were the case, actually, I don't know where I go from there, but uh, I, uh, I don't know if she's changed her mind. So if she's considering being chair, I would probably consider saying yes, because um, I think she's probably more in line with the way I think, uh, and probably Tim as well. So I'm not saying that I'd probably endorse um, Rochelle. And what, oh, I don't know we vote on the slate, isn't that what we're- I, We are going to go ahead there. and have finished with discussion oh. for everybody who would like to do that. Did you want to talk, have discussion? Or? No, I just like to vote. Uh, well, this is a shock because I really did meet with everybody and discuss all of this. Uh, I guess I'm not clear, Tom. Um, you would like Rochelle to be chair. Rochelle, do you want to be chair? Because you clearly told me you did not. Uh, well, I don't want to, but I'm the kind of person who's willing to do what I'm uncomfortable with and don't like um, if it seems like the best thing to do. And in what way do you think it's the best thing to do? Um, well, because the, the voters have asked for a change in direction and uh, it seems like leaving the chair at status quo would leave the direction of the board um, and the books and our children's sections at status quo. Again, all I can say is I'm Purely shocked because I met with every person, and this is not what I was told from each of you. So I don't know what to say beyond that. I, I can have a little more discussion. I thought our discussion, which was off site, um, was just to get a feel for where things were. This was not a decision making one on one meeting. So um, I didn't see myself as being held to it. And when I was told that Rochelle, was adamant she didn't want to be, at least that was the impression I was given. Well, then um, I have to think again, what do I want to do? But if she's willing to step up to the plate, I'd probably be more than willing to vote uh, for Rochelle to be the uh, chair. But that's kind of how things changed in my mind. So well, it, was, it wasn't like I was telling, telling us something there. It absolutely was a meeting of two people at a time to get the feel. And I did get the feel from each and every one of you that this slate was appropriate. And the reasons we talked about having so much change in the CLN right now and changing up the chair, the, the chair position is a lot more than you think. I honestly don't think you're up for that position, period. So Vanessa, I'll just say for myself. And I'd like to, oh, go ahead. I made it really clear to you that that was not what I was thinking. You proposed it, and I said, that's not what I'm thinking. And I said, I'll consider it. And we talked about the reasons, but I didn't really make a decision. And I didn't, I didn't say from the onset, I agree with you. I don't know if you remember that. I don't know, it was a couple of days ago. I probably don't remember it right. So one of the things that I would like to say is that um, as the board chair, I have done my best to, I have certainly opinions, but I certainly have done my best to um, be, to make certain that this board stays legal, first of all. And secondly, that we stay legal in terms of parliamentary procedure, um, but not that we would be taken to court for that. Um, the other thing that I have done my very best to do is make sure that the board stays fair and respectful to the entire community. And I would continue to do that um, very solidly. And I have a considerable amount of experience in doing that. And I understand that the board has changed. And I am willing to continue to, to help this board move forward in a very the in the way that the community yes the community has made a decision but i'm help willing to help this board move forward in a way that would be 
solid for a public library system for this community. So with that. Uh, speaking again, at that's very sequence here. If you're not the chair, Katie, um, we're not losing your corporate knowledge here. You're still a member of the board. So if Rochelle is struggling in some area, I'm assuming you're going to give her as much coaching as necessary. Uh, so that's another reason why I started thinking, well, if Rochelle changes her mind and she's willing to take on the chair job, you're not gone. You're still here. You've got a lot of years of experience on the board. And so I expect Rochelle would be, would be receptive to giving giving coaching and some guidance for a, a different chair. Anyone else? Yeah, I want to say that that's pretty rich because you're literally saying you don't trust Katie to be chair for one year while you guys learn. But you also, as you kick her out, you want her to help, which she's the type of person that would help. But that's rich. Anybody else? I'll, I'll go back up. No one's kicking anyone out of anywhere. We're, we're here and we're voting on a slate of proposed officers for this board. It's not, in my opinion, shouldn't be a contentious issue. It's a, just a round table discussion and no one's being slighted if they're not getting the position they want. That's my opinion. It, it's not about getting slighted. It's about the whole board falling apart. That's what I'm worried about. Um, Katie is definitely knowledgeable and capable, um, but it has been made progressively harder for me to get things on on the agenda, and that's a primary concern right now. Um, and you asked if I wanted to be chair. I don't want to be chair, but I'm willing to do it. Okay, so the motion on the table is to, can you read it to me again? Robinson moved to accept the officer slate from the nominating committee. Okay, so it's been moved to accept the nominate the officer slate from the nominating committee. Um, and we're done with discussion, is that correct? Anybody have anything else to say? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? No. Okay. Um, then the next item on the agenda is election of officers. And since I've been just voted out, then it will be your job to move okay. forward. Okay. Uh, let's see. So I guess according to uh, Idaho Code 33 27 22, uh, or wait, no, I'm skipping the line. Uh, according to Idaho Code 332719, I would entertain nominations or well, actually I haven't been voted in as chair. Oh, that's true. Um, then that that's a good point. So now what do you want to do? <laughs> I'd like to make a motion to uh, present Rochelle Audison as candidate for chair. I'll second it. We don't need yeah. second. Okay. Um, uh, okay, it's been moved to um, uh, nominate Rochelle Audison as chair. Um, is there a discussion on this? I think it's about it, yeah. Anybody else? Any more discussion? All I right. personally would like to have Rochelle. Um, she's Palmer, I are not qualified, and Rochelle has the same direction that Tom and I are wanting to go, and uh, she can make the agenda the way for the meetings, the way we, what, what topics we would like to bring up, and I think we have the best chance of moving forward with Rochelle. Okay, any more discussion? Okay, it's been moved to... Um, uh, Nominate uh, Rochelle Audison as chair. All those in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. Opposed? Absolutely not. Okay. So now we also need a vice chair. And so, um, okay. Um, so I would entertain a motion for a nominating vice chair. I'd like to move a motion to nominate. Uh, 
Tom Hanley as the vice chair. Okay. Any discussion? Yes, I'm wondering if it wouldn't be wiser to have somebody as vice chair who isn't just brand new, that they've had a, a, at least a year under their belt to, um, to uh, um, you, you know, uh, do something. And so that it would be, um, I think it would be, I can't imagine coming on a board brand new and accepting a, a, a position as responsible as chair, a vice chair as a brand new person. Um, well, since I didn't really want to be chair in the first place, um, I'm hoping any year from now, someone else can take over. And so I think it would be good training for Tom Hanley to be vice chair. And I think Tom is fully capable with his past experience of what he's done to pick up what he needs to do to learn the position. And I, other than in the absence of the chairman, when he would have to run the meeting, I don't think his responsibilities are that insurmountable for him. I'd accept the position. Um, Nothing I'm real anxious about, but uh, I'll certainly be watching and learning uh, just in case I have to step up, but uh, that's not an expectation. I'm going to do the job. Any further comment? Okay, uh, well, then we will vote on uh, Tom Hanley being vice chair. All those in favor, say aye. Okay. Aye. Those can vote myself. Aye. Okay. Those opposed? Abstain. I'm going to vote nay. Okay, so the ayes have it, and Tom Hanley is vice chair. Uh, next, we will have appointment of treasurer. Uh, we have Julie Saad has been. Uh, nominated from the nominating committee for the treasurer. Uh, do we have a discussion on that? Rochelle, can I interject? You'll need to have another motion for both the treasurer and the clerk since the board voted to not accept no. the nominations from the nominating okay, committee. Thank you. Uh, I would entertain a, a motion on that. I would like to move a motion to present Julie Saad as candidate for uh, treasurer. Okay, any discussion? I, what I would like to say is I read her um, resume and I think we are lucky. Julie's shown interest in the library board for a, a year and I think we are lucky to have someone with so much background uh, in public accounting to step up to be a treasurer. Uh, this is you know, she's she's it's wonderful that somebody would do that from the public. So I want to thank Julie for doing that. I looked over Julie's resume in her letter last night and uh, it appeared to me a very qualified candidate. So I would support. The idea of having her as the uh, board treasurer. Okay. Any any more discussion? Okay, we have a motion for uh, Julie Saad to be treasurer. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so that's five ayes. Um, so Julie Saad is now our treasurer. Uh, I would entertain a motion for clerk. I'd like to make a motion for Tim Plus to be clerk. Any discussion? Okay, I think uh, I think Tim Ploss will make a fine clerk. There's no further discussion. And all those in favor? 
Okay, uh, any notes? No, okay, so Tim Clerk is, or Tim Paz is now our clerk. Uh, we will now have the Spirit Lake Annual Report by Carol Ferguson, the manager. This is our Spirit Lake Library Board Report. Appreciate everyone's patience while we deal with technical difficulties. You're awesome. All right, Spirit Lake Library Board Report. I'm going to talk to you about staff, highlights of adult programming, youth programming our facilities, and the community. So this is a Spirit Lake staff. In the middle, we have Tiffany, who subs between the Apple, Raftrum, and Spirit Lake libraries. This is Nicole, Canada. Yeah, circulation specialist in a small library. Everybody does everybody's. We all fill in and work as a team. She does our helps out with adult programming and youth services.
Not to push the arrow button. Is it so it's not cursing. Is the arrow button work? See on the computer if the up and down arrow works. That's the same too. Or left and right. Oh, we abandoned ship. Mm -hmm. Forget it. We have Rain, who um, does all our displays, circulation specialists, and use services. We have a new gal named Sasha, who does our I think we're probably good with. We can email out the display yes, that we'll talk quite later. All right. Well, thank you for preparing the presentation. Anyway, mm -hmm. sorry it didn't work out. Uh, I look forward to that being emailed. All right. So now we will go to the consent agenda. Do we have discussion on that? Uh, I have a question. Um, when we're consenting, are we consenting that we agree with the contents or did the contents accurately reflect that particular meeting? That was kind of a question I had too for, for new trustees. Um, it, it's, um, it's just consenting that yeah, that's what happened. Not necessarily that you agree with what was said or what happened. Okay, I don't necessarily disagree with anything in there. I just want to make sure I understand what I'm accepting. And one of the things, um, and, um, uh, is if there's any kind of um, grammar or spelling corrections, because this does go on the website, so it want we want it to be presented in a way that there's no misspelled words because um some you know it's a lot to write down and sometimes there's there's mistakes in that way oh well, my question was is some of this already in a report that was given to us i don't really yes, yes. It's, it's, yeah. there are copies of the, the last agenda no not yeah. that, what she's presenting yeah is well, that I, is okay. that part of this i doesn't seem to be part of this report so it's something new we haven't seen so right yeah I have a couple questions on the um, the sin page. Um, the on the first page, amendments to agenda, the COA upgrade, and I know that COA is on the back as well. I'm just not sure what COA is, and I know I've heard that before, but COA is our ILS or our library specific catalog and right. circulation system where we hold accounts. OK, that's why I knew it. And then um, at the very bottom of the first page, uh, just out of curiosity, why do they want to go from, uh, why do they want to go to Teams from Zoom? Or I mean, you know, get rid of Zoom and start using Teams instead. <clears throat> um, I can yeah, answer. Yeah. 
Um, so the meeting is held at Coeur d'Alene Library and they have a subscription to Teams and so they're trying to use what they have versus a software that they don't necessarily need to have. So okay. that's all. It's just a software preference. Okay. Yeah, I was just curious. Thanks. So that was this cooperative information network. That isn't what we were talking about, is it? Or you just come in on that? It is what we were talking about. It's part of it. The consent agenda would be uh, minutes of the special meeting from the 5th of May, minutes of the regular meeting of 18th of May, minutes of the CIN meeting of 19th of April, and the May CIN financial statements. And consent agenda just means that typically there's not a lot of debate. There might be some simple corrections. Um, so it's usually just a way to dispose of things. Uh, I'm still back on the Spirit Lake report. And I thought that was part of what we were consenting. I didn't catch that. Oh, okay. Nope, I'm sorry. There's... All right, are there any corrections to the minutes? Okay, then I would entertain a motion to accept the consent agenda. I'll move that we accept the consent agenda as presented. Okay, it has been moved. Can we second things? I forget. No, uh, no, we have follow Robert's rules for small. Um, it has been moved to accept the consent agenda as uh, presented. As presented. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. Aye. Or, aye. aye. Okay. Unanimous. <laughs> then we will move on to the next thing, uh, which is the Community Library Network May 2023 financial statements. Uh, any comments or corrections? <laughs> I would be curious if the staff had anything to say. I, I'm happy to entertain any questions, but I don't have any specific things. I think everything is detailed in the cover and in the information. <laughs> I have a question. Um, under other assets, uh, the Pinehurst bequest, is that something new or has that been on this for a long time. Pinehurst bequest. Uh, oh, and it's uh, it's on the third page of the actual. Um, it's on the balance. It's on the balance sheet. Right. I is that has that always been there, or is that something new that is not new? It's not new. Okay. I guess my question would be for the staff is, I didn't study this over here, but we're talking about these green sheets now, right? Yeah. Um, is there anything that is uh, unexpected, out of the ordinary? Uh, are we running over budget on anything? So I might just comment at the top of it. Um, they politely put the percentage of the year that we're in. So we're approximately in 66.67% of the year. So one quick measure would be to kind of go down the year to date spent budget. And then if anything is much higher than that or much lower than that, then that might be something for us to address or give comment on. Um, library budgets, you know, um, certain times a year, like right now we're spending on summer reading and, you know, supplies and things like that. Our book budget usually gets spent more of a, over a 10 month period. So more of one tenth, one tenth, one tenth, and then other materials. So we do have some standard things that we do in terms of spending. Um, but generally speaking at a quick glance, you can tell quite a bit where we're at um, by that percentage. Um, I am hoping to be able to do a little bit more training and education. We're going to have an audit finding report. We can ask the auditors some information too. And um, 
I think, um, and I'll, I'll credit the staff in this, I do think this green sheet is really helpful. That's where they've articulated any of those things that they think you might have a question. So they're being a little bit predictive for you. So the big one I see there is snow removal, 109%. We're obviously well, I, not gonna have that anymore this year, but I, I don't know what happened there. I understood from people that we had five months of snow up here, <laughs> so it was an exceptionally long snow period, I guess. Um, you know, usually it's snow removal in the winter and then summer landscaping, things like that. So I think we're done with snow. Hopefully. Do you have any further questions? Okay, if there are no further Comments. I would entertain a motion to accept the Community Library Network May 2023 financial statements. We move that we accept the financial statement for the month of May 2023. Okay, it has been moved that we accept the financial statement uh, 2023 May. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, moving along, uh, we have the resolution CLN 615 2023 1 change of bank signature card. Uh, that is an action item. Um, OK, so it says action item, so I guess we need to vote. I would ask the staff what to explain. Oh, OK, um, well, the, so would that be the director? Staff? I would ask the director okay. to explain it. Thank you. Uh, could you explain that? Too? Sure, and we actually have our attorney here, too, so I can refer it to her as well, if that's OK. And Miss Katie wants to talk about it, but. Um, yeah. Shoot that back to you. Alex. Oh, okay. All right. No problem. All right. Um, so I will mention we do have a financial management policy, and in that policy, it outlines um, who has the ability to sign on behalf of the organization. Um, our district has over checks over five thousand dollars are signed by um, two individuals, um, and it usually is made up of the director, the assistant director, um, the chair, and the treasurer. Um, and so um, once this is signed and moved as a resolution to um, authorize those individuals to be added to those banks, bank accounts. Um, I don't know if Janelle has any other clarification on that or if that makes sense. OK, so we need a so we would motion. A motion to approve the resolution which states that i move that we um approve the resolution uh cln 0615 2023-1 for change of bank card signatures i'm sorry can you say that again speaking right down um I, I, i'm i move that we approve uh resolution cln 061523 uh, 2023-1 change of bank card signatures Okay it has been moved that we approve uh, resolution CLN 61523-1 change of bank card signatures all those in favor? Aye. 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 Are they, so, are they signed we, now? We have the form in our packet. We uh, didn't. We need some discussion. Oh, sorry. Uh, any discussion on that? Yes. I guess my, my discussion is we have the form in our packet. So is it signed here at the table now? Or I'll send it to the printer. Yeah. Sorry. I'll be sending it to Carol to print out to be signed. Yeah. Okay, and then do we sign that now or do we yes. sign after that? Okay. Um, 
OK, if there is no further discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Um, I would like to say that before uh, the before the vote, the motion, it doesn't. I mean, everybody remembered it, but before the vote, the motion needs to be stated again. Oh, so right. that everybody the end typically. Uh, as I've said, you certainly the board chair can vote under the rules for small boards, but we don't we haven't ever done that before. OK, yeah, I, I know that it's just trying to remember everything all at once. Um, it, it'll be a process. Um, so should I restate the motion? As I think it passed. passed. Did we? OK, I don't know. Did it? Uh, yeah. Yes, and it's three or four. Yeah. Uh, OK, any opposed? All right, uh, no. the, the ayes have it and the motion has passed that we approve resolution CLN 615-2023-1 change bank card signatures. All right, and now, okay, so should we wait for that to be printed? You have it, Carol? There's a lot on the agenda. I'm sure they can okay. do it afterwards. Okay, uh, then we will do the signing uh, after the paper comes out. Uh, we will now have the director's report. Thank you. So in your packets, you guys were sent quite a document. Um, I don't know if you guys had any questions. I'm assuming you guys all had a chance to read it and if you have any questions. Um, I will make note that um, I'm very open to presenting information to you guys and how you prefer it. Um, it you know, um, so feedback is great for all of us. Uh, we're happy to provide the information, however it's most useful for you. I wonder if there's a uh, expected format of what these reports follow. Is there kind of an outline? Should they include certain things. I read some of it and looked like some of it was a day in the life of the librarian. I talked to these people that came in and showed them these books. I, I, is that normal or is there supposed to be this is how many people came this month? How many books we loaned? Uh, are there is it a report on the library? What that particular facility did during the month? So we have both facility or manager reports. So like Carol here at this library yeah. will put together a report. Um, generally, um, it's inclusive of everything that's kind of happened. Um, some managers like to tie that to our strategic goals. So you'll see some of them tying it to our strategic goals. So they'll talk more about facility or they'll talk more about programming. Um, included in there is also from our coordinator. So youth services and emerging services, adult services, programming. Um, and so their reports mainly talk about the whole district's programming in that area. There's no template, if that's kind of what you mean. We allow people to um, kind of highlight what happened that month that they're proud of and that they want to share with you. The purpose of this in the past has been to um, to inform board members of what goes on on a more daily basis because we have seven buildings throughout the, the district. And um, just to let people know, to let board members know um, more of a story behind what happens at every library. The statistics are kept in a different um, way. And I think board members have appreciated that. In the past, we've asked people to, um, to address the strategic plan as in their stories. What are their, what are their libraries doing that address the strategic plan issues? Um, and I don't know if we've gotten away from that a little bit, um, but that, that was the purpose of it. And board members have in the past found these invaluable. What I would be looking for, maybe in addition to the stories, is uh, what's going wrong or what are problems. Um, and all I see are glowing things here. I just, I don't know that there's issues that the librarians or the, the that facility is hiding uh, or something. I'm just, if it was a standard format, it might, well, it I might mean, show how things are going, the health of that facility. 
I know like facility problems and things like that, those are going to usually be reported more in a facility report um, in the meeting. So IT issues, things like that, um, parking lot lighting, anything like that. So um, this is mainly for the services. Um, and so the other there's other reports that kind of talk about that. Yeah, and I have yeah, lots no. to learn on this, how you do it. I'm just was curious how, what it was meant to do. Well, we'll continue this way, but feedback and modification, we're happy to to do what the board wants and finds helpful. I will say it's very long, so mm -hmm. I I like one page a person. <laughs> I, I tend to be a little bit more succinct, but I don't want to limit people if they have a lot to share. So. And then. I do have circulation statistics. Um, and I like to get as much as possible out um, in your packet so you have more time to review them. Unfortunately, some of our statistics come late. It depends on, um, and so you may get the statistics at the meeting. It's the oh, same it's as the same ones that are on our mm -hmm. desk already. Mm -hmm. Some people didn't oh. have them. So. Oh, okay. But that's okay. I have plenty. And if you want it to be two pages, I, I confess when I saw that it was a little small. It's small. Mm -hmm. So if you want to tell me 10 font is good and two pages is preferred, I'm happy to make adjustments as well. Well, what, what this is, is there's the manager's report that goes through each library briefly, and then there's a Youth services report that goes through youth services at each library, and then there's is it adult programming, wherever that is. Is that, is yeah. that kind of the? And then there's also emerging. So adult programming, youth services, and emerging technologies um, are what we consider kind of our coordination of services. And so we'll have manager reports, and then we'll have those coordinator reports. And I will say occasionally staff are out of town or on vacation. And so um, if you miss a report, you'll get to the next month. So. Hey, Ashina, I'm not sure this is in here. Or this was already uh, the unique monthly recovery statistics. So I usually consider that as part of um, the financial statement. Unique is a um, provider of collection services for people's accounts that are in arrears. So this is just a summary. I don't know if you had anything else to add, but just a summary of where we are. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about this again if we want to do kind of a deep dive into financials and things like that. Um, but here I usually just look at the total return on investment. And so if that's a positive number, then generally speaking, it's worth us considering continuing to go after um, collection items. So I don't understand the ROI. What's the so rate of that's I mean rate of return? And let me make sure I'm I'm going to clarify here with my staff too as we're talking. So we send um, users members to collections if they have lost and damaged materials over a certain amount, yeah. which is here. $100. $100. So this isn't like one book. It's usually multiple books or significant debt owing to us. And unique management is a little bit non-traditional in collection services, but they charge us a flat fee. Okay. So a lot of collection agencies charge a percentage on what they recover. And we have probably long been using unique, um, probably 10 plus years. Um, and again, they have um, generally a great reputation 
Um, you know, we want to collect, but we don't want our image as a library to be very heavy handed. And so the feedback that we have gotten um, from this is that they're professional. And so the return on, on, on investment, if you look at um, how much we've been invoiced and how much we've collected. So if we get more money back or get materials back versus what we've spent to recover it, that's our overall return on investment. Is that? What's the, uh, the payout is to this outfit unique or what, what's the, what are you comparing it to the payout for what? Um, so um, if you would, um, individuals have accounts with us and they have a balance. And so we're basically getting funds back to zero out that balance. If that makes sense. I could just said that, that compared to what you've been invoiced. So I don't know. What, what's the invoice part? So on this bar column, you can see like in May it was $58. In June it was $291. Um, you know, they have it broken out into, um, so we send them a report on a monthly basis. We report members who have past due accounts on a weekly basis, a weekly basis. and we have a flat fee per member when we report them for collections, mm -hmm. and then we are billed monthly for whoever we have sent to collections. And we have been getting either paid back or the materials back at a higher rate than what we are paying the collection agency to help us with this. So the return on investment is for every dollar we spend with them, we're getting for this month. We for this month, this report, we got fourteen dollars back in return. So we they obviously did their job. Is that right? That's how I see it. OK. Right, and would you explain waves to the trustees, please? Um, a wave is where um, items, charges have been removed. Um, our library does not charge fines. Um, however, do we have historic fines on our records? So yeah. there may be some um, account issues that we resolve. Like sometimes an item will be waived. Um, if the person claims that it was returned and in a good faith measure, we take them at their word. And so a person can have one of those items on their account waived. Or if you have a 21-year-old um, who wants to renew their library card and they had a card when they were 12 and they have four books out they haven't used for 10 years or whatever, we're going to in good faith more than likely waive those so they can get reestablished with the mm -hmm. library. Does that clarify that? Is that clear to you guys? So, so all of these dollar amounts, is this the initial cost of the material or is it the market value or what what are, where do the dollars come from? What does it it's, cost to replace it? It's the amount of money in our cataloging system that an item is assessed at when it's added to the collection. So like a hardback book has a different price than a paperback or a graphic novel. So that's what that amount is. So then you're going to be billed for the cost of replacing based on what it was purchased as. So that's to if they had to buy a new book to replace it. That's an estimate. Yeah, that's an estimate of the price. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, well, do we have any further comments or questions? Um, are we moving on to circulation statistics or about that? We still have a few more items yeah. for me to go over. Um, so you do have your circulation statistics um, and we can go over any questions that you might have with this. I can just do a quick summary. So circulation is another word for checking a book out. Um, it can also be included of checking movies out, um, circulation. We have a library of things, so items out. 
um, those are all included in that. And so we give you a snapshot across the top. I'm still learning some of our library's codes, and I know there was one PK kind of um, cracks me up um, about what what branch that is. Mm -hmm. um, but the rest of them, I think, kind of make sense, but they're abbreviated across the top. Um, and so circulation, I was mentioning, includes our books and our physical items. It also includes our ebooks and our audio books um, through services like Overdrive and your Libby app. Um, Freegal is a downloadable music service. Um, and then we have our internet and computer use. Um, and again, I think the data is most um, useful when it's applied in context, and that's why we have some of that where we're at information, like last year's information as well. Materials added, um, generally those are physical items that are added. Um, I'm not sure if our statistics here include our ebooks and e audiobooks. Generally, it's usually just our physical items that are added. Um, we keep a list of our new patrons, and you can see by which location. Um, and you can see some of our libraries are really growing in membership. <clears throat> we have our total card holders. Um, each person can select what they consider kind of their home library, so to speak. and. Um, that's where those card folders are reflected per branch. Um, we have door counters, so people coming in and out every day are counted, and that's what the people counter information is. Um, and this is the part that I confess. We do have some information about adult programming, online video programming, and meeting room use, and so those are a little small. Um, if you guys prefer one page, I can continue printing them on one page, or if you're okay with two pages, I can do that as well. Um, but again, we have our programming broke out, broken out, programming attendance. So this is just for informational purposes, um, but I think it's helpful to sort of track trends over time and you'll be able to start seeing some patterns like children's programming, teen programming, very popular in the summer, uh, very important to our service. Um, and then other programs different times a year. Right, I was going to comment. It's typically, we we're seeing a snapshot of May, but I don't know how that compares to last May or last month. So yes, I'm not saying it's worthless. I, it's just, it's, just I mean, there's it, it's limited because it's, it's nothing to compare it to. I guess there's a comparison of last year under each of these categories. It's mm -hmm. the total, and then what we had exactly this time last year. So that's one form of comparison on this sheet. Mm -hmm. And we also do an annual report where we highlight some of those sort of big statistical changes that we're seeing. And so um, I personally like to look at things more annually and trends over time, and I'm happy to kind of give us a snapshot of that. But historically, the board likes to review things on a statistical basis every month. I'd encourage you if you could uh, maybe add some pages with uh, graphs of this okay. so I can see a running maybe show over t over time this year instead of just individual numbers or some kind or individual oh, I don't know anyway maybe there's some way we can graph it and see trends easier I'll try some things and yeah. you guys will give me feedback about whether you like it I'm a very visual person so I do like visual representation so um, I'm happy to try some things and again just tell me how it's most helpful for you like I said I personally find data in a very narrow view not that helpful I find it help more helpful over time okay, and then you also can keep these and so you can compare it next month to mm -hmm. this month mm -hmm. And then the next item I was going to mention was a little bit about a facilities uh, update. Um, the biggest news is really uh, we have put out an RFP for the roof replacement at the Hayden Library. Um, so we're working with an architect. The board approved putting out the RFP before, and so um, it's in the neighborhood of $200,000. Um, we met with the architect, Randy, our facility manager, and I met with the architect and we discussed some options, um, you know, competition, flexibility of timing. Um, so they'll have approximately 30 days to get the work done 
and um, the deadline is September 22nd, hopefully. So bid opening will be happening um, at the architect's office. And so hopefully for our July 20th meeting, um, we'll have some information. And then what would be expected of the board is to accept the bid. Usually it's the lowest bid, but it'll have been reviewed, but we'll kind of walk you guys through that process as well. So. I was curious about it. Um, it was, it's for the Hayden Library, is that Hayden correct? Hayden Library. Was that a regularly scheduled um, roof replacement or was it leaking? Um, is it 20 years old? Or I, I'm just kind of curious. I saw it when I went through my packet. Um, so I'm just a little curious. Yes. Was it a surprise or was it something we were expecting and just scheduled? Um, it was not a surprise. It's been leaking for a while. Um, there's a portion of the roof that's in okay condition, so that part will not be re-roofed. Um, there was an addition at one time, and so there's a little bit of work that needs to be done to seal up that portion, um, and then it's um, essentially re-roofing um, 80%, 90% of the roof. It's just a very small portion that won't be re-roofed. Um, it's been in the documents uh, for the board for, I think, several years it's been coming. Um, the funds were um, not set aside, but we do have a capital budget right. um, that we can use for those expenses. And so it's been earmarked for the board. They re recognized um, last time that um, we do need to, to do this. Why is an architect involved if it's just re-roofing re -roofing portion? I guess, I don't, are we changing the style of the roof or? Um, I, don't, I don't know the history of this. Yes, um, you know, it, it depends on the size of the project, whether or not our staff would manage and be the project manager um, on a project. Um, this requires, because of the um, scope of it and the dollar amount, it requires a lot of things like public works licensing and requirements. And so um, it's on a case by case basis. Um, we have landscaping improvements and our staff manage those projects, but because of the scale of this and complexity of it, um, we're utilizing their service as project management. And I so also jump in. This particular project, because it's for a specific dollar amount, has to comply with Idaho Code competitive bidding procedures. And because of the nature and the complexity of the construction contract and in compliance with the competitive bidding procedures, mm -hmm. um, the management of this type of project by staff and then the contract documents that go with it, um, it's just better handled by a third party. So the architect is doing the managing of the project. It's, we're not designing a new style of group or something. No. Okay, I didn't understand. They put in specifications. So, you know, they make sure that we're getting a quality product. They're also responsible for doing visits to make sure that we're getting what we're paying for. Um, they do the final punch list and essentially mm -hmm. we'll let the board know this is appropriate mm -hmm. in our opinion. Um, they're really the professionals in that. Um, anything else facility really? That's the big one for you guys, and it's coming to your meeting next month, so I want to make sure you guys know about that. Um, and then if I can just kind of move on, you guys have in your packet the meeting and study room policies. And I don't know if there was any questions or discussion on that. I honestly don't have as much background on why this was requested to be in here, but it is included. Yeah, I mean, last easy. month we brought these policies to the board for comment and revision. Um, and the reason they came to the board originally was so that they are in alignment with our current practices. Um, and um, we made the changes, listened to the board, and then Rochelle asked for final versions just to be provided in the packets. So that's why they're in your packets today but they were approved at last month's board meeting. So this is mostly informational for you. Can you just review, is it the red is changes, new, th new sentences, and what's the yellow? Is yeah. 
the red on page one of the meeting room policy was an addition um, to what was presented at the last meeting. The yellow on page three was a spelling correction and number 17 was also an addition made at the last meeting. Are there any questions on that or comments? Um, well, did you have anything further to add? I did not. The, um, just commenting the other items in your packet are news items that mention the library, um, and it's just been the past practice to include those as well. Um, again, it's not required. It's just for information purposes. Um, this packet ended up being pretty long uh, because of this information as well. Um, you know, we can talk again about what you guys prefer to see um, and what you need. So. I have a question. Is that strictly limited to the uh, Coeur d'Alene Press? I know those, I think all those articles were. I'm not certain about that. And has that been going on? That's a routine thing from, to have those things? They, oh, sorry. I'm just kind of curious. There's I don't know. From this I saw them when I was So it's, it is. Um, it is a wide variety it's of written sources. Mostly from the Coeur d'Alene Press and Spokesman Review mm -hmm. um, that these are pulled from. Um, and it, is that something we've been doing for months? Is that a routine thing? I, I don't know. I don't, yeah. I don't guess you don't get board packets. Be, it has before. been happening for um, quite a long time. Okay. Yeah. And there just have been an inordinately large number because of what's happening in our community. You know, personally, personally, I like them. It lets us know what's being said out there in the public. So mm -hmm. thank you. I like getting it. Just back on the meeting room policy. Um, I wasn't involved in this and I don't know what all brought it on, but um, I'm a little confused by number 15. Adults must remain with children under the age of nine while attending the meeting programs. Exceptions can be made. Uh, meetings of group under the age of 18 must be supervised at all times by an adult. So how does that work with the first sentence? What, why did you single out under the age of nine to have an adult, but then you say if they're under 18, they have to be supervised? We do have some other policies that um, we have some information about children in the library and use of the library. Um, and so it's related to another policy that we have. Um, I do have um, some information for you guys, and I am putting together um, I'll just mention it. Um, this is our policy. So there's a lot. So I will be presenting you guys with this information, um, but I'll just mention that it's related to another policy so that it's consistent. Um, in terms of who can be responsible for our rooms, we require adults being responsible for the rooms. Well, that's the last sentence. That Adults must be su must supervise if they're under 18, but I we don't have, understand how that. Judge. We have a children in the library policy, so you must be with a parent or caregiver if you're nine or under. So that statement, the first statement in number 15 is basically just reaffirming that you can't have one parent with 25 eight year olds in the meeting room, like the eight year olds also need to have their parents there with them to adhere to our children in the library policy. I don't know if that provides clarity or not. Not really to me. I mean, are you saying that anybody under the age of nine is one on one? You have to have an adult for each person under nine because you aren't saying that. You don't have to have one on one adult like a family could come in with their children and one parent, but it aligns with their children in the library policy. I don't like number 15, but it's written. <laughs> okay, so this policy has been passed. Um, it can always be brought up for oh. the vision at a, at a separate time. 
So, um, so is that our timer for the um, entire the libraries? That was the final okay. answer. Stable policy is time to move on. Okay. Um, well, if there's no. I, I just made one comment. I really liked the packet I got in the mail, by the way. Whoever puts it together, it was well written up and it was nicely sequenced because I started to read the agenda and then everything sort of followed through it. So thank you for whoever prepares this thing. It was a nice job. Okay, um, so our time is up for that portion. Um, the paper uh, for the signatures, the resolution CLN 615 2023. Uh, we will need the clerk and the chairperson to sign that, and then we will have our Spirit Lake Library tour in just a minute. Shall I stop recording? Are we done uh, like, right now? Sure. The break? Okay. So then are we regrouping it? 11:15, or how, what are we doing? Um, well, we're going to find the the resolution, and then we're going to have the library tour just to okay. familiarize ourselves with the with the library. Okay, so do I need a witness to well, the signature here? I was going to say it says tour and break. I'd like oh. I'd like break some lunch and so I was in grade school. <laughs> um, okay, uh, yeah. So we'll have we'll have the tour, and then. Well, actually, I guess we can take the break first for a few minutes, um, except for the clerk needs to stay here to sign. And then we'll have the, the tour after this is signed. You're supposed to make a note of that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, we will now have our fiscal year 2024 budget discussion. I think we have. It's not that it's, oh, it's, the it's hour. an hour. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, sorry, I misspoke. Uh, we will be having our trustee education provided by Katie Brereton, the library's attorney. Thank you, Rochelle. Um, of course, some of the board members already know me and um, Tim and Tom, uh, we welcome you to the board. Um, I am the attorney for the library. I serve um, as general counsel. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of background about myself. Um, I'm an attorney with the firm Lake City Law Group. Um, one of the, I've had a, a relationship with the library for a number of years now. Uh, I am part of the um, ICRIP um, defense attorney panel. And so um, my relationship with uh, the library began um, several years ago um, through the ICRIP policy. There's um, assistance that public entities who are insured by ICRIP um, can get when they are dealing with um, some employee issues and um, uh, ICRIP uh, connects the entity with um, an attorney um, who can assist them through that. And so that's how I first began working with the library and I worked with um, John Hartung, um, who is the library director from a couple of years ago um, on some issues. And um, I worked with the prior um, library director. And um, then uh, last year um, I took over uh, from one of uh, the attorneys at our firm. Um, she was the um, general counsel for the library and when she um, left to take a different position um, as in-house counsel. Um, she uh, made the connection and I started uh, working with the library as their general counsel. Um, and so um, what I want to do today is you have been given um, a lot of information from Alexa. <laughs> and uh, spiral bound. It's spiral bound and there's a lot in there, a lot to digest. And you'll have time, you know, on your own to to read through those materials and to become more familiar with them. And what I would like to do today is kind of hit the high points of some things that are not necessarily going to be super explicit um, in the information that you've been given. Um, and that there are, are just some things that um, I think can be helpful in the transition from your private life to your public life now that you um, are public officials. So. 
Um, the first thing I want to start with are um, public meeting laws, and I just have a couple of things to um, hit the high points on about this. So, as you know, our public meeting laws require that public entities in the state of Idaho hold their meetings um, in the public um, with the public welcome to those so that um, the public's business is um, public. And so one of the things that um, a lot of um, entities um, need to be aware of is the um, possibility of creating unintentional or serial meetings. And unintentional and serial meetings are when um, you have two or more members of the governing body um, discussing public business, um, but not during a public meeting. So um, sometimes this can happen when you're you know, sitting around having coffee or something and you happen to talk about something that came up from the last meeting. And it may be an item that is still open for um, on the agenda for business um, that you would be discussing later. And so we want to avoid um, doing things like that because if um, you, you create a meeting, you have to then go back and cure um, the, the public meeting violation. Another way that you can create an unintentional or serial meeting is when you receive email communications where it is an email communication to the entire board, but it's not necessarily from one board member to another, but then you start replying all to the email and you have a discussion via email. So just make sure that when you are emailing, like if uh, Alexa emails you something like the board packet, um, and you see an item there that um, is on the agenda for the meeting that you maybe want to kind of learn more information about, you know, like what's this going to be about or something like that, that you address those to just Alexa and not to the whole board. Um, you also want to be aware of that um, you can create uh, serial meetings or public meetings by any means of communication. So not just email, not just in person. You could do it by text message um, or, or any sort of other messaging feature. So just be very aware of that. Um, the other thing with respect to public meetings that I want to hit the high point on is executive sessions. So executive sessions have a specific purpose that's recognized um, under Idaho law. And the purpose is for the public body to be able to um, discuss items that are not ready to be discussed in public um, or items that they're not ready to make a decision on in public. And executive sessions encourage um, break and open discussion about those items among the board members. So as you know, um, there are very specific um, reasons why you can go into executive session, and those are all established by Idaho code. So one example is to evaluate an employee, and that applies to all public entities. And so the evaluation of the employee may be something to do with their performance, and it may have um, something that uh, you need to decide upon about um, their employment. Well, you want to be able to have frank and open discussions in executive session about that, and then you can go into your public meeting to make a decision about something like that. But the purpose, like I said, is to um, have those uh, private discussions, and, and sometimes it's also about things um, that are not subject to uh, uh, disclosure under the public record law. Um, and uh, there may be other things that you go into executive session for, too. Some of them um, are going to implicate the attorney-client privilege. And so particularly when you're um, speaking with your attorney during the um, executive session, those um, communications are generally going to be covered by the attorney-client privilege. And for the library in particular, the attorney, the library attorney, their client is the library. And so each of you as board members have the obligation to um, keep the communications that the library, acting through the library board, has with the library attorney confidential. And the reason that we want to protect the confidentiality of those communications is that if you reveal confidential communications to a third party, they lose the protection of the privilege, meaning that they can then be disclosed um, and you 
generally don't want that to happen. You want to have those communications that you have with your attorney about things that you need advice on um, as the library board and as um, representatives of the library. You want those to remain protected. OK, yes, yes absolutely. Oh, and I should say if you have questions, please do. I would love this to be, you know, more of a, a discussion. And if you have questions, I'm happy to, to answer those. So is, is the attorney uh, representing the board or is it representing the library director and staff or is it direct, is it is it um, giving uh, guidance to both? That is a great question. Mm -hmm. So um, as the library attorney, my client is the library. And so in that role, I may advise the board. I may advise the library director. If I'm working with the board, it's going to be on things that are within the scope of the board of trustees responsibilities. So policy making, um, if you have uh, concerns about uh, budgetary things or, or questions about stuff like that, um, those are things that I would advise you on when, um, you know, we're um, in the process of um, changing your personnel policies or something or updating them. Those are things that I would advise you on. Things that I would work with the library director on are things like public records requests or um, employee matters for the library and everything. Um, so I at times will um, be working with um, the board and then at times I will be working with um, Alexa on things that are under her purview, but I represent the library as a whole um, and it just depending on um, what type of situation we're discussing, it'll depend just on who I'm directly communicating with. Does that answer your question? Yes, I believe so. Okay. Thank you. Kim, did you also have a question? It was kind of along the same, okay. same lines. Um, I don't know if there's ever a conflict, but it sounds like you pretty much got them in different buckets so you know not to mix things. Well, yeah, and, and with respect to any sort of conflict, as the library, as my client, there's not a conflict among or between, I should say, the board. And then if I have to give advice to um, to Alexa or um, something in that regard. Um, because uh, there's just the single client. Um, the client can only act, I mean, because it's an entity, it can only act through the people who are a part of it. So um, with respect to how the library is structured um, by statute and with respect to what the delineated responsibilities are for the board and then for the library director. It's just a matter of that you wear different hats and then I adjust to those, if that makes sense. OK, and, and you will you won't be afraid to tell us if we're asking. We're, we're going over the fence into the library director's area. You just tell us. Right? Well, um, <laughs> I can assure you she does. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> we'll we'll do it in a very diplomatic way, and I'll just say, you know, these are things that that are under the library director purview, and then you know we just remind because obviously this is a transition from uh, from a few months ago, and so we'll just you know make sure that we're all on the same page about what your hat is, um, and then what the library director's hat is. Okay. Well, if we're gonna, if we're having questions, can I go back to the meeting? Yeah. Um. The so you said two or more members discussing anything, so you can't discuss anything with another member. I thought it was. I always thought it was. We couldn't have a quorum. Okay. So um, you have to have a quorum to make a decision. Um. So a quorum for you would be at least three. Um, but under Idaho law, you can create a meeting if there's at least two um, members of the governing body who are discussing. And let me also clarify this. And, and there are actually really good examples in the um, in the one of the packets, the spiral bound packets that Alexa gave you that's from the Idaho Attorney General. It specifically talks about situations and it, it, it has these questions that it proposes, one of which is, wait a minute, can like people who are on a board like never talk to each other outside of a meeting? No, that's not it. 
what you should be careful of and just cognizant of if you are talking with each other outside of um, a meeting is what you're talking about. So are you talking about something that is a piece of business that is currently before the board? If you're doing that, you run the risk of creating a meeting. Um, and you, that's what you want to avoid. Um, because just the, the whole idea about um, making sure that um, when members of a governing body are discussing the public's business is that it's with the public there um, to hear those discussions and everything. And so um, the idea of a serial meeting, which is that I'll just give you an example, you and Rochelle might talk about something and then Rochelle and Vanessa don't talk with you about what you and Rochelle talked about, but Rochelle goes and talks to Vanessa about what the two of you talked about. And then Vanessa then talks to Tim and Tim talks to Tom and you're all discussing the topic, not as a body, and maybe it's just the two of you, but the discussion about a topic um, is happening um, without the, the with, with um, outside of the confines of the public meeting. So that's what the, um, that's the intention of the requirement in Idaho law. But if it's not a, some, a topic that's ever been an agenda item, it's okay to talk about, it's only a gen, something that's come up on agenda that you can't talk about. I don't want to, I, I'll give you a lawyerly answer. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it doesn't, I don't think that that the way that the law is interpreted, it's confined to whether or not it's been an agenda item or whether it's already, you know, something that is no longer on the agenda. It's, it's generally, you should think about it as library business. So whether or not it makes it to an agenda item um, or previously was an agenda item, you should think of it as a library business. And so if you're going to talk about like library business, um, you should do that during a public meeting. Okay. Any other questions about the public meeting stuff? And if I'm going too fast, just tell me, I'm just, I'm very cognizant of your time and that I'm on here for an hour, but I'm, I'm trying to not take an hour of your time. So the only way to get, I'm, I'm a little confused still. The only way to get an item on an agenda is you have to talk about it before and get at least between one of us and the chairman to agree to put it on the agenda. But you can't talk about that because it's not on the agenda because in, in a meeting, public meeting, it's just not on the agenda. So how do you talk about something you want to put on the agenda without breaking it by talking it outside of the that's a good question. <laughs> if, uh, I know that um, for our meeting today, um, there's going to be um, a, a time period at the end of the meeting where you have the opportunity to propose things to go on to the agenda for mm -hmm. the next um, meeting. And then that's I believe that's how it's been handled in the past, which is that it's, you know, somebody wants to um, bring something up for discussion um, and they um, propose um, an agenda item. And then I believe, I, and this is also how I understand a lot of other public entities do it too, um, for the person who is creating um, the agenda, which should be Alexa, um, you can talk with Alexa about items that you want to put on the agenda. And if you talk with Alexa, you can talk with her as much as you want to, because that's not a meeting. That is what has happened. Uh, the director has um been in charge of putting the agenda together. We can call the director to put items to look at agenda items as well. I mean, that's what's really important. And the director is the starting point for the agendas. But it, but it looks like on today's agenda, as we said, one of the later items on there is discussion of future agenda requests. So we talked about them then, but if we dream up some new thing, we can just send an email to Alexa and possibly have that entertained, or is that then go to the chair to make a decision before the next meeting? Uh, I'm not sure if I understand. Just like, I'm not, I'm not against anything, I'm just trying to understand it. 
Well, and a lot of times trustees come to me for just information, like someone came and asked information. I want this policy. I want that policy. And so um, people sometimes kind of are giving me a heads up in that way ahead of time that they're interested in something and reviewing something. And so, you know, I was mentioning, I like to have a calendar of policies that re we review. I like to, so, you know, the agendas have some ongoing things. I mentioned last meeting or the next meeting, there's going to be the RFP, the bid to approve. So, so a lot of times it's a discussion in reality about how much stuff is already on there, how long the meeting is, timing of it. So, um, and then I also work with the chair to talk about, um, you know, where we're at um, and what we need to get done. So it is a discussion as well. Um, and like I said, I really, three and four hour meetings are very intense. So it's, I would rather send you stuff in advance to read. I would rather, you know, keep our business business to action items. Um, we have some items on here and we'll talk about it a little bit later. So I'm bringing some suggestions about special meetings, right? So special meetings that can additionally um, add in um, time for us to do training, things like that. And so a lot of the ideas that people bring to me essentially become training items, discussion items that way with no action. Um, so. We, we also have a board calendar, which highlights the things that come up throughout the year that we absolutely have to pay attention to. Um, well, I'm glad that you're, you're asking questions because that's important. Mm -hmm. So the next thing I want to talk about a little bit are public records. Um, so under the public records law, the library director is the custodian of the library's rec records. So um, all um, public records requests are directed to the library director and the library director is responsible for responding to that public records request. And because of the number of exemptions um, in the public records law um, and because of um, the requirement that um, the public be allowed to observe the public records. Um, we want to make sure that um, we follow the provisions of the public records law for how the library is responsible for responding to public records requests, which is why we have one person who deals with the public records requests. So the reality is that in practice, uh, when the library director receives a public records request, usually it's for something and they can just um, fulfill it and respond to it outright. Sometimes there's um, a large volume of public records requests that come in, and then sometimes there are public records requests that come in that are requesting records that are exempt from disclosure. Um, and if there's a uh, if there's a request for um, a record that is exempt from this disclosure, the library director will then work with me to um, ensure that the library gives an appropriate response um, to that request. Sometimes it's a denial based on an exemption. Sometimes it's a partial denial. Um, and we work together on the appropriate response to that. The reason that I bring this up is that if you are to, in your roles now as um, elected officials, if you're to, to receive um, a, a request from a constituent or a member of the public um, for records of the library, you need to direct them to the library director because we want there to be a central person who is responding to public records requests. And this is because there are pitfalls to when we don't follow um, the public records request law, right? We might um, release records that are exempt from disclosure. Um, we might not release records that are subject to disclosure. Um, and so um, releasing records that are um, subject to um, an exemption um, could open up the library to liability. If we don't release records that are subject to disclosure, that also opens us up to um, a lawsuit to enforce the Public Records Act. So we want to avoid those things. So if in um, your, your time, your, uh, someone contacts you and says, hey, I would like a copy of this, or hey, I would like a copy of that, just um, redirect those to um, the library director and she can work on responding to those. The other thing that I want to um, counsel you about is 
um, to avoid unintentionally making public records. So um, you may have a personal email um, that you use. And I think that everyone still maintains their personal cell phone. I don't think that any of the board members have a library issued um, cell phone. You do all have, um, or you will have um, a library um, specific email. You want to use your library email for communication of library matters. Um, I would strongly suggest and advise that you not use your personal email address because once you start using your personal email address for public business, then your personal email address becomes subject to, um, it, it will become subject to a public records request. So all of those things where, you know, you might be discussing last week's, um, you know, football game or the fishing trip or something else or your kids um, and then you start talking about uh, you know something to deal with the library you've then uh, made that entire um, email a public record subject to disclosure so just avoid doing that and just use your um, library email address for communication about library business um, the other thing that you on that what if a constituent uses my personal email to ask an, a question. Do I copy it over to my library email and respond or? That's what I would do. Yeah, I how, would do. how do I get it? If you write somebody writes to me on my personal, how do I get it out of my personal? Well, if they write to you on your personal, you don't have to respond to that, right? You could res with your personal email address. What I would advise doing forward. is to actually I, you could forward it or you could just start a new email and say, I received your email to this email address. I use my library email address for all library business. And then you could respond, you know, you could say something, you know, like you asked this question in your email. Here is, you know, what I would say about that. Does that um, answer your question? Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, don't create an unintentional public record with your personal email address. You could also create an unintentional public record with your text messages. Um, so just I would say that if you're going to put it into uh, a written format, just be really conscious about what written format um, that you're putting that into. Other thing too is that I don't know if you do, a lot of people maintain social media pages. I know a lot of um, elected officials also maintain social media pages. If you have a personal social media page, I would suggest that if you want to use social media to communicate with your constituents and members of the public, that you make sure that you um, identify that you maybe have a more official um, page, you know, something that's like, uh, Tom Hanley, library trustee, and that you discuss public um, things and things to do with the library on there. Because if you use your personal um, page um, and you discuss library business or things to deal with the library um, on that personal page, that's also going to create a public record. And I'm going to talk a little bit um, later um, about also the implications for um, discussion um, on your uh, social media pages. Any questions about that? Uh, I have a question. Yes. For the most part, should we expect any kind of questions or discussion with the public to pretty much be directed toward the chair? Because does the chair speak for the board and therefore deflect most incoming in, you know, questions? I'm not expecting any, but if I did, is that the appropriate channel? Because um, I know we speak as a board. It's a member. I'm not. I'm not. I don't have any individual power. I realize that it's it's a five person board. So, is it um, is it is that appropriate that or the proper channeling that if, if someone says, hey, how come you did X or the board did this? Well, I suggest you direct that to the chair because Michelle, I don't want to answer questions though. So, <laughs> um, Katie, do you want to chime in on how that's been maybe handled previously? That's what we've done in the past. Okay. Along the same lines, if a constituent writes to me because he thinks I can solve a problem, you know, maybe the <clears throat> parking lots need painting or something, um, and he thinks he has a way with me, do I just basically 
forward that on to Rochelle or am I allowed to answer it? No, we don't paint parking lots. <laughs> Yeah, Lindsay, please okay. chime in. So um, the library, there is on our webpage where you can contact the board members. And I would encourage you to direct your constituents to use that method because that then goes to all the board members and the director. So then you aren't trying to decide who's getting what message. Just tell them to voice their concerns through the website, through the board's email contact. And that solves a lot of this confusion. So. And there are some operational items that I'll just volunteer for the board. I'll handle this. I'll contact that person back. Okay. And so it'll help that way too. I think that that is um, a, a good point that Alexa just brought up. Um, that that operational stuff is not under our jurisdiction. We're policy. We're not parking lot lines. <laughs> I'm just thinking if there's somebody, yeah. a constituent that thinks I have a way to solve some kind of problem and they don't want to talk to everybody. They think I have an inside edge, so they're talking to me directly. Basically, I'm not, I shouldn't work with them one-on-one -on -one, or since it's not a open meeting thing am i able to communicate well, yeah so the, so if you're communicating with a constituent you you don't have to worry and it's just you know one-on-one -on -one or whatever um you don't have to worry about um creating any sort of public meeting or anything um but i would circle back to what um lindsay and alexa and katie have said which is that you want to just remember one what your hat is um, and the responsibilities that come with being a trustee and then those other responsibilities that are dedicated um, to the, the library director and then the employees who are under the purview of the library director. So say that it was just something like with parking lots or something, you could definitely say, you know, hey, um, I hear you, you know, about the parking lot. I'm going to direct you to talk with our library director or I'm going to direct you to our website where you can, you know, email um, the entire board because maybe the entire board, you know, would like to hear about that. You know, maybe it's something about a policy um, that that is under your purview as the board. Um, I mean, you you can um, you have the discretion to exercise your discretion about um things um, that you communicate with um constituents about and everything i would echo what tom said is that you just also need to remember that um, as a member of the board you don't speak on behalf of the board and you don't speak on behalf of the library you speak as tim um, and you you know just want to make sure that that's very clear in your communications with um, uh, a constituent or a member of the public and use use the library email address. And use your library <laughs> email address. <laughs> okay. Any other questions about that? Okay, I'm gonna move on. How's how am I doing on time? Good. You have 28 minutes left. Okay. <laughs> okay. So here's uh, a topic that um, I often uh, deal with a lot um, from uh, public um, officials and public employees and. Um, this also happens a lot because of my role um, in representing public entities um, in litigation matters um, and representing public employees in litigation matters. The big question that comes up is personal liability. And so um, under your, your iCrit policy and under Idaho law, as long as you're acting within the course and scope of your employment and without malice or criminal intent, you're not going to be held personally liable um, for any of your decisions or actions um, in your role as a trustee. And um, this is by statute, the Idaho Tort Claims Act says this and everything. So uh, I just wanted to kind of hit the high point on this because it's such a it's a common question that I get um, when um, when um, there's there's liability issues that come up and everything. People are worried, well, you know, do I have to pay this or um, do I have to pay for legal fees or anything like that? Um, by statute, um, you are considered, even though you're trustees and you don't get paid to do this, um, you are considered um, employees of the library and the library in the event there were to be any sort of suit um, by law is required to provide a defense and then also required to 
um, pay for any sort of settlement or judgment that might come from a suit. Um, and then because the library has insurance, that then means that ICRIMP is actually the one who um, provides the defense and then would pay for any sort of settlement or judgment up to policy limits. Um, any questions about that? That's all pretty clear. OK, good. OK, I think I'm, I'm going to not even use the full 28 left. Uh, personnel. OK, so what, like we've talked about um, uh, already just a little bit, um, the uh, personnel of the library, um, the board is um, responsible for the hiring and the supervision of the library director. Um, by statute, the library director is then um, uh, uh, responsible for the hiring, the firing, the discipline, of um, employees of the library. So everybody who um, then is um, in circulation or is um, with building maintenance or who does IT, those are people are all supervised by um, the library director. And the library director obviously has people, um, she has the assistant library director, there are managers of um, each of the branches and there's a, a you know an organizational structure to how the employees are um, supervised. Um, something that um, that I particularly with library districts that is um, something that is kind of a an interesting thing is that um, by statute um, library district employees, including the library director are what is called for cause employees. And what we're all very familiar with, particularly um, with private sector employees, is that Idaho is a right to work state, meaning that um, employees are considered at will and can be um, terminated from employment for any reason, no reason, and with notice or without notice. There's no requirement um, if there's an at will employee to provide notice of a termination or to give them a reason for that. Um, what is unique to library district um, employees is that um, they are by statute required to be um, given notice of certain forms of discipline. Um, and then they have to, um, before that um, type of discipline is imposed, they um, are entitled to a hearing before the library director. Um, and it's only after those two things are accomplished then that certain discipline can be imposed. Um, so that's just something that I wanted to make you aware of in that when it comes to employee issues, there's a very specific um, uh, manner in which employee disciplinary issues are utilized. And they're just a little bit more complex than um, what they would be if it were, if the employees of the library were at will employees. Any questions about that? I think um, just to be clear and uh, at this point in time, um, that it for new board members, the only um, person that we have any jurisdiction over is the director. And that um, I limit what I talk to about staff, which you're doing a wonderful job, you know, you know, show me, you know, pay, show me the library, that kind of thing. Um, no directives, no, you know, no um, uh, interrogating, that kind of thing. That isn't our job. If we're concerned about what somebody's doing, we talk to the director. So it's all about talking to the director. Thank you for that, Katie. All right. And my last topic that I want to talk about is um, the intersection of your private life um, and what was your private life and public life. Now. Um, and I want to talk about this in the context of the First Amendment. Um, and in the context of that, in uh, as, as an individual and as a private individual, um, there are certain rights that you um, have under the First Amendment, and those cannot be abridged by the government, right? Um, and now in your 
uh, position as elected officials, you're now in the position of the government, right? And so there are certain things that um, as part of that transition that um, I just want to highlight for you and just make you aware of so that you're um, conscious of these things in your new roles. So there are three um, scenarios that I thought were pertinent to um, your new positions. So one is what is your responsibility at public meetings? And this is something that actually will largely um, because of um, uh, the board chair position that the board chair is the one who um, uh, decides. But at public meetings, when you have the periods of public comment, um, you have the ability to um, create rules for the public comment period. And under the First Amendment, you can regulate the time, place, and the manner of, um, of uh, public speech at a public meeting. And to the extent that um, you want to uh, regulate or create rules about the content, um, you have to be really careful about that. And what I say by the content is that what the, the person who is taking the opportunity to make a public comment, what they're saying. Um, and so um, there is uh, authority out there um, that supports that um, public entities can um, create rules for the public comment period that um, are directed at maintaining um, the decorum of the meeting. Um, so these are things like stay on topic with, with what you're talking about, or we can discuss items that are um, on the agenda. Uh, it can also be that, you know, you uh, create rules that discourage um, disturbing the meeting or something like that. And those are all things that the courts have said are fine to do. Um, what public entities can't do is um, restrict um, a person from speaking or tell the, a person to stop speaking based on um, if they're saying something that they don't like. So uh, kind of the, the way that you'll know that if you've asked somebody to stop speaking that it is content or viewpoint based is if you ask yourself, am I asking this person to stop speaking because I don't like what they're saying and what they're talking about and their viewpoint, then that's where you're going to get into some troublesome waters. But everything that I've seen so far at our board meetings is that um, the public is allowed to come and to speak and, and they have their opportunity to share their thoughts and their views. And the board chair says thank you after they, they have spoken. And so um, that's just a great way to handle the public comment period, but just something that I wanted to make sure that you were cognizant of. What about, uh, again, I see you made a rule that has to be on the agenda. <clears throat> Is it, you kind of said that's okay, but that limits the types of comments that can be made. Is that, are, are you saying that's not necessary maybe, or we can do that if we want to? Yeah, so I'm not familiar with particularly the, the rule that NIC came up with. Mm -hmm. I'm just just letting you know what um, what courts have said um, can be reasonable um, rules and, and some public entities um, have chosen to impose a rule that, hey, if you're coming up for public comment and you you want to make a com public comment, it's it needs to be about something that's on the agenda for that day. And, and that's and, and that's you, our, you could cut them off if they veer off their topic or something. Or, um, I, I would say that in that type of scenario, generally, my advice is that um, is that you just let them talk. Um, and it's specifically because you already have a time limit and that time limit is generally, you know, there might be some um, individuals who go a little bit over the three minutes, but because you already have the the time limit, if if they're continuing, you know, to talk for a couple of seconds more, um, my advice is, is generally to just let them um, speak and um, to not, uh, uh, you know, tell them, hey, you've, you've veered off the, the agenda item or something. And that's just because there could be a difference of opinion as to whether or not they have heard off the agenda item. Um, and, and generally, I think that the board has not employed um, a rule that uh, 
members of the public need to only address things that are on the agenda. They, they, uh, the public has been welcome to um, bring any issue uh, that they want to before the board. Any other questions about that? It seems like it's been a fine line between limiting people's free speech and um, what, you know, and am I, and it's difficult to sit there at the moment and say, oh, well, you've crossed that line. How do I know? Um, and it also has a tendency to enrage people. And that doesn't seem to be beneficial to anybody in the room. So in general, it seems as if the three minute rule for you can come in and talk about the movie you watched last night for three minutes seems to be the thing that has been the fairest um, and most reasonable. Mm -hmm. We have had to limit the amount of time because it took a, it was taking us an hour and a half to get through public comment. And it seems as if our public comment has gotten better since we've done that and limited the, the chunk of time. And I will echo that it, it is a fine line um, and, and kind of something that I think about with respect to, you know, cutting someone off or, or telling them that they have to stop speaking um, if they are, you know, under the three minutes is that you can't <laughs> unring a bell. Um, meaning that if you have um, told someone to stop speaking and if, um, it was not on a proper basis. Um, it's done. You you can't go back and cure that. Um, so that would, you know, if it was if if there was any sort of allegation of of content or viewpoint um, discrimination, that would um, you know possibly open up the library to liability. So that's why I'm more on the side of uh, being prudent um, about public comment and uh, using the time, place, and manner um, rules as um, the guidepost and um, just generally advising that if somebody wants to come in and talk about the movie that they just watched and they want to do it for three minutes, we'll let them do that um, because there, there are other avenues that, that can be used. Vanessa? And, yeah, I'd like to say that um, many a times um, during public comment, um, I'm thinking to myself, they're not on topic, but I can see where they think that they are. Mm -hmm. So even it could be the movie they watched last night mm -hmm. that, and but they're trying to make a point. Mm -hmm. So it would be hard to cut somebody off because they're not on topic or on agenda topic um, when they're they crafted this thing for the last month and they were so excited to get up there and say it. Right, and they think they're you know on point. And to us, maybe they're not, but that's how they're getting their point across. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, it's it would be viewpoint discrimination to stop somebody in yeah. those cases. Yeah, and I would just think of it, that's such a good point, Vanessa, um, of of in the moment where you're hearing what they're saying, you're like, this doesn't necessarily sound like something that's on the agenda. Um, you know, you make a, a decision in those couple of seconds, what's then going to happen is that it'll be reduced to, you know, a briefing that's filed into court and there will be tons of analysis on this that takes tons of time and, you know, a case law about this and a case about this. And, you know, there will be so much more time dedicated to proving why or why not it was viewpoint discrimination when, you know, just kind of what we're talking about. The simplest thing is just to um, provide the public with with that time um, and uh, and to let them um, bring whatever matters that that they want to talk about to the board. Yeah. OK, so um, as I had mentioned earlier, I wanted to talk a little bit more about your social media pages, um, and this is what I was going to talk about. So if you do maintain a social media page um, and you um, engage in discussion on that social media page with um, constituents, members of the public, um, and you're talking about library business, you would also have to observe all of these requirements um, in your discussion. Um, so you can't delete comments um, that you don't like. You can't um, block users 
um, who say things, you know, that maybe are not things that are very nice. Um, they're they're um, with being a public servant. It comes with um, both uh, people who support you and it comes with criticism. And part of what the First Amendment says is that if you have opened um, your social media page as a forum, um, that you will have to um, provide uh, and we will have to abide by those time, place, and manner um, restrictions the same way that you would um, in a public meeting. So that would not be a public meeting, but it would be um, a forum for public discussion. Um, and I would just encourage you that if you're um, using social media, we can talk a little bit more about how to properly use that um, and how to um, just make sure that you're cognizant of the requirements for um, complying with the First Amendment and using social media. Okay. The next thing scenario that I wanted to address is that, uh, like we were talking about at the very beginning, obviously you came in here with your First Amendment rights intact because you uh, were private individuals and now you've assumed a, a public role and Sometimes there's a question about um, what sort of First Amendment rights do you have as public officials? And you essentially have the same exact rights that you did um, in your in your more private lives. Um, so when you're speaking um, as a public official, um, you you enjoy the right to express your thoughts, your opinions, your viewpoints, and your criticisms. Um, all of that um, remains protected speech. Just the other side of the coin that you want to be aware of is that each of your other uh, board members also enjoys those same exact rights. So the right to criticize. And this is actually um, something that comes up um, sometimes in, in uh, case law um, and, and in uh, litigation matters is that um, there's a, a criticism between or among um, elected public officials and sometimes um, a censure. Um, not censor, <laughs> is employed. Um, and what the the courts say is that um, the, the criticism that comes with public office is just something that you have to deal with. And so um, uh, criticism from, from uh, one person to another is an accepted, um, uh, uh, is acceptable under the First Amendment. Um, other thing that I wanted to just advise you on is um, when you are speaking um, in your role as a trustee. So whether it be here at a public meeting or out um, when you're just um, not in a public meeting, but you're talking with people and you're talking about how, you know, you're doing your job as a trustee and everything is that um, what you are saying should be um, anchored in the truth. And this has no um, implication that you would not do so, but it's just to make you aware of that. Um, the, the ability to criticize um, must be anchored in um, a true fact, and it cannot be solely um, for the purpose of causing harm to another. And this just comes out of um, a defamation law um, and the um, applicability of that to uh, um, public um, officials. So um, generally, like I was just saying, your criticisms are going to be protected under the First Amendment. The only way that they're not going to be protected um, is if you make a statement in bad faith, meaning that you know it's not true or you should know that it's not true. Um, and if, if that's the case, then um, that criticism is not going to be protected by the First Amendment. Um, and then the final point that I wanted to talk about in the scenarios of of um, when the First Amendment um, is going to come up is what the library's um, obligations are under the First Amendment. So, um, you know, from your, your uh, trustee manual that Alexa provided for you that libraries um, are places for um, the public um, and that the public come to, to uh, the library to be able to learn and to um, engage in, in, um, and receive information and ideas. And the First Amendment, um, with respect to the ability to, uh, the First Amendment protecting your right to speak, 
but also protects your right to receive information and ideas. Um, and so one of the things that um, when it comes to receiving information and ideas, um, the library has um, recognized by law um, a considerable discretion in deciding um, what to add to its collection. And um, your library director and then the librarians who are um, employees of the library, they follow um, practices, best practices um, that they have received training on, um, that they are educated about um, with respect to how to um, create a collection for the library. And so there are certain things that, that they'll observe. I'll actually say if you go on the Idaho Commission um, for Public Libraries, there's a lot of good resources on there that are available to the public to better understand how librarians actually create um, their collections and everything. The, um, the First Amendment is going to be more implicated when the library decides to remove a book from a collection. So there would be times when the library removes a book from the collection as part of its, correct me if I'm wrong, weeding process. And um, the weeding process is where they follow standards that, that um, assess um, the book and, and they say, well, this no longer needs to be um, a part of our collection. And generally when they're doing that, they're not really gonna take the content of the book um, into consideration um, because it's going to, it's my understanding, it's gonna be based on the condition of the book and whether it's still relevant and, um, uh, if there's other, you know, numerous copies available in the library and stuff like that. So lots of lots of things that they'll consider when um, uh, weeding the collection. But if in the process of weeding the collection, the content of the book does come into consideration, um, then um, or or if there's a discussion and, and we all know that there's um, a policy by which um, there can be a request for reconsideration um, of um, a book that is in the collection um, for removal from the library. So in the context of that coming up, um, what you just want to keep in mind is that when you remove a book or restrict access to um, material, um, there are um, requirements um, for the library to comply with the First Amendment. And I'll just tell you what the, the standard is going to be that that we'll, we'll be discussing if and when that situation arises. And it's just going to be that um, the library will have to demonstrate that the restriction is necessary to achieve a compelling government interest. And there are no less restrictive alternatives for achieving that interest. So that's just, I'm I'm reading it because it's pretty wordy. And that's the standard that's just from case law about the standard that the library will have to meet um, in order to be able to remove that book um, or restrict access to that book and still um, be respectful of um, the First Amendment. Could you repeat that again? It's yeah, the first me sentence. Yeah, sure. Um, if um, there's going to be a removal of a book or restricting access to a book based on the content of the book or the viewpoint expressed in the book, the library will have to demonstrate that the restriction is necessary to achieve a compelling government interest and there are no less restrictive alternatives for achieving that interest. And so those are the discussions that that you'll have like I said, if and when um, that situation arises and everything, if it's, you know, a part of um, like a request for reconsideration. So those are um, all the things that I had to uh, talk about with respect to trustee education, at least for today. <laughs> I talked with um, Alexa and we do think that there will be some more opportunities um, to get into finer points about um, what it means to be um, a public official. And it can be things talking about, you know, Robert's rules of order um, and just um, some things that we may not be able to talk about here today. You can also contact me directly. You don't have to um, wait for a meeting 
um, you can email me. You won't create a meeting if you email me or talk to me um, and I'm available um, for that and everything. So if you have questions about um, anything that we've talked about today or if you have other questions about stuff that comes up in the future or about your role as um, a public official, you can feel free to shoot me an email or give me a call and I'll give you a card after the meeting as well. All right, thank you for your presentation. Thank you, um, Rochelle. Moving right along, uh, we don't have our fiscal year. Can I just say one thing um, I, I, before we move along? Um, I, I, it's taken it's taken me a while as a trustee to understand that um, the First Amendment in my life personally isn't something that I have to practice every day in my household. I can, you know, not have whatever I want in my household, or, or you know, I can whatever. But when I become an elected, when I became an elected official, my job is to make sure that the people um, that I'm representing um, are the First Amendment protects them. And so I become the protector in a way that I was, I didn't get until, you know, the, so the first, the first Amendment applies to me differently as I am an elected official. Um, and that's all I had to say. All right. Thank you for your comments. Uh, okay, so now we will start with our fiscal year uh, 2024 budget discussion. Um, yes, yeah, so I all of you should have a booklet that I put on your tables as well. Um, there is, I'm going to say starting with, there's a lot of information coming at you. And so part of my role, I believe, is to also help prioritize um, and to help um, uh, direct your attention to some of the critical information. It is not intended to limit, it's just a good starting point. So if you have more information that you need, please ask for it. Um, I did print these out for you guys. I think it is very important that you guys are at least familiar with this. These are essentially the statutes, but I know Ms. Katie talked a lot about case law. And so it is actually more complex than just interpreting it. It's the interpretation of case law as well. And so you have multiple resources at your disposal. At your disposal. Um, in this packet, what I've created for you is a very simple, the bylaws. It is also available on our website, but I know some people have you know, stated their preference for printed materials. Um, I'll mention in that if you guys prefer, you know, a laptop, an iPad, the library can purchase that for you and I can send things digitally to you. Um, I'm happy to do that. I've just gotten so far some feedback that right now people like paper and I'm flexible. So please let me know your preference. Um, you also have your trustee job description in here. There is our annual report, which I kind of talked about some of the data and sometimes we try to present it in a little bit bigger picture way about the trends that we're familiar with. There is a copy of your current adopted budget in here. Um, there's also our strategic plan, um, which was for 2023-2025 uh, to familiarize yourself with. And then there is the you'll have already probably heard mentioned the staff compensation and benefit report that full report final report is in here for you um additionally what the board has done till now is put together um with a modification of some compensation ideas um a salary scenario a budget um sample uh, salary scenario B sample, and then they've also included, um, and we'll talk a little bit more at some upcoming meetings about property taxes and 0%, 1%. So there's a lot more to come, um, but I essentially see this as homework <laughs> that everybody probably needs um, to get up to speed, at least to get started with where um, the board needs to be. I don't want to say that we're behind, but we do have a lot of work to do. Um, and on the agenda, I have some ideas to kind of get there. Um, I would recommend um, putting together some dates where everybody is available for discussion and we can notice them in advance and have them as special meetings so we can go over some of this. Um, in my mind, I wanna make sure we have time to answer everybody's question fully. Um, and so it's summer. 
people travel, there's a lot of, you know, scheduling realities. And so my preference would be to set several appointments essentially for that time so that we have enough time. And if we don't need the discussion, then we can cancel them. It's it's much easier to put all of our schedules and then, you know, cancel them if we have what we need. So um, that would be a consideration. Um, some specific things that we have to do coming up. Um, we have an audit finding report. Um, and there is some statute requirements. We do need to have a presentation with this board. Um, and so. Sorry, um, I thought we were having the budget discussion. Well, and, and so the budget process, there's also budget hearings that date august 10th essentially has been set um we have to notify newspapers for public hearings so i am going to be walking you guys through the process um the entire board through the process um i recommend having multiple dates for the action of approving the budget if you approve it at your first meeting then um, you don't need a second meeting and you can cancel that. But again, I think it's in everybody's best interest to kind of lay out on their calendar to make sure that as many people on the board as possible is available. One question on the budget. I, I know this budget hearing, that's a county required hearing. It's on the property tax assessments that went out. They've already scheduled that. Um, is that the deadline for when we have to have the budget done or is there some other. Yes, I, I assume that, there's that's, a deadline. Uh, that's, for that's, for that's, or something. That isn't that isn't the essential the total deadline, but that's basic. The basic budget has to be done by that meeting. I would think there'd have to be time for printing for the hearing. It's the it, what that is, is that would. And I'm sorry to jump in here, but I'm concerned about the time and I'm concerned about the fact that it's the easiest to put together meetings when everybody's in the room. Mm -hmm. And so um uh the budget hearing is what we we have gotten basically all our thoughts on paper and we present them to so it isn't it isn't the but the budget approval is the final which is on the 17th or the 24th that that is our actual final approval date but the hearing itself is where we put it together enough so that the public can come and comment on it and if they have comments that change our minds then we can move that, but most of it needs to be done by August 10th. I'm just wondering if it's more like July 15th or something. To we don't get, get ready to get ready for August. 10th. We only get two really big checks. Like 80% of our budget or it comes in two big checks. Is it 80 something where, you know, something like that comes in two big checks. One is at the end of July and one is at the end of January. And the one at the end of July, we don't get that check and that so there's a crunch time right at the end of July um, when we get that check and we see the real numbers and then we but know that was based on last year no that check always comes at the end of July and that I know, I know but it was based on wasn't it based on the budget set from last year it's already in the works people are paying their taxes now your the check the money that we will be looking at budgeting will be that it will be a lot of it will be in that July check because we will have to hold money forward for the next year. And so in order to set that budget, we need to look at that check. Am I doing this right? I don't mean to talk to you and I, I'm just trying to say. It is correct that we get our last big check in July and that helps us determine how much we'll have available for carry forward to operate for the first four months of our next fiscal year. But we also don't get some of the final um numbers from the county until the end of july and that we have to use those numbers in order to build is called it the form is called an l2 that once the budget is final um that l2 gets reported to the state and that's why i do have a date on here july 25th as a that is an important date as well um we should have the final information i believe on the 24th and so that's an important date for us as well. Uh, I have a question. Besides the budget, are there any other statutory deadlines that we have to deliver on? Meaning we can't not have a budget. That's not acceptable. That's not that's not an option. Are there any other things that from a law standpoint, from a statutory standpoint, that we need to factor in? Because there's lots of stuff we can add to the agendas now and then, but 
Is there anything that must be done besides a budget? You have to have an audit finding. We have okay, to that's report that. Right? Um, it has not been scheduled. There's not been a motion so to. Um, these are proposed ideas of yeah. dates that are, but the board will have to. But besides that, so, is that the so what? I, okay, I'm I'm looking at the time. I know that the library opens at one. Is that correct? Yes. The yeah. library opens at one. If we want to get what we need to do, those. Those considerations can be talked about, but I think at this point in time, what we need to do is nail down these dates that people are able to make these meetings because we are having it isn't I'm not trying to not do that. It's just that we don't have time. Right, but that would just and be a yes or no. I'm just saying. I don't, yes, there's, there's a lot of other things. Other things. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Okay, that's all I'm asking. Yeah. OK, just so at some point we need to prioritize our role. That's all. I don't want to go through them all. So thank you. Okay. I, I, I was going to follow that with the this uh, compensation study, where does that fit into this? Is it part of the budget or is this another thing that we have to have special meetings about? So um, staff wages is usually 65 to 73 percent of a library budget. So um, it's a very serious consideration for our, our budgets. And so and and Rochelle can maybe talk about that, the history of doing the, the study and the presentations and things like that. Um, but it has been discussed in the board in the recent last couple of months about staff compensation. But, but you gave us this report. Is yes. this just for our background information? Is there something coming up? We need a special. There candidate. are recommendations that were presented in there from the professionals. Um, and then if you want to review some previous minutes or meetings, you could also see there's been some discussion about um, what we may be able to afford. Um, and um, you can maybe look at last year. Some of the other members can talk about partially adopted last year intention to perhaps partially adopt something this year. We're in a, in a time crunch, so I'm I just wanted to get you guys some homework to kind of these, this is what was my opinion of what you might need to get up to a little bit of speed um, and to help prioritize because you guys have a lot of stuff. So I don't want to overwhelm you. Is any portion of this manual confidential or is this? Oh, you know, not open record, but. Is any of this stuff confidential? Like, does it have individual salaries anywhere or anything like that in there? Not that anybody's going to, like, you know, run off my car and look at it. But. I mean, it's the proposed budgets and those yeah. things are not working. The strategic yeah. plan and uh, most of this was off of the website. Okay. So generally speaking, one rule of thumb is if it's on the website, you can. Well, I recognize that, but yeah. I obviously didn't digest this whole packet here. No, so it's not necessarily confidential. Not that I'm posting it anywhere, but okay, just so I understand. Okay. Um, I will make one adjustment if I can with your permission. Um, the special meeting for the audit finding, our auditor um, has actually said they're only available June 22nd in the afternoon. Um, they do a lot of public audits, and that is the only spot that we have. Um, so. That's it. A time in the afternoon, it's flexible, um, but it, it needs to be that day, and I apologize. And then um, again, I just there's a lot of different ways for us to do public meetings. Um, some people prefer a retreat style, and it's like an eight hour day or two eight hour days and lunch included, and we go through everything all at once. Other people prefer like one meeting every three hours and shorter meetings and more frequent. It really depends on the trustees schedules, their commitments um, and their availability. And I did kind of mention summer tends to be a little harder with travel. So sometimes people have already existing travel. And so I just want to. Is is June twenty second a possibility? And what time? Two, three, four. At what location? I just need to kind of have some direction on that. Um, you know, do we want to continue the nine to noon? Um, no. And do we want to do evenings and weekends? See, this is the kind of I know. There's a lot of new people, and I don't know your commitments. And so, um, if we so want, so the auditor can't come any other day. June 22nd is it? OK, that is a day I absolutely won't be here. So that doesn't matter particularly. But I was I'm surprised she doesn't have anything else. OK. 
this is a busy time for because of the requirement to document it with the state by the end of the month. So is, it, is are we limited to that particular subject only? Like, you know, it's a special meeting. We take the time out, we go. It's scheduled for 30 minutes. Um, so I, would, I would recommend if she's just being presenting on her own that we make that an hour. I think you may have questions. And so just in fairness, I would I would recommend that. Longer. But I mean, is that is that what we're going to limit that meeting to subject wise? So my recommendation and again, it's your decision, but I usually like to keep the regular meetings for what I consider action items and business and it's on a schedule and we publish that schedule. So I don't take statistical reports or financial reviews, something like the RFP and the bid because that's already such an all board meeting and um, it's already been discussed and it has big implications. I would prefer and recommend that we do those that are our monthly regular meetings. Um, special meetings usually are focused um, it focused is how I would describe them from non routine regular business. Um, it can be training, it can be committee meetings. So let's say you decide to review an art policy or something like that. Committee meetings can be specialized, special meetings. But generally speaking, I try to keep the regular business on the regular meeting and then other items. Can the agenda be posted with other topics? Yes. Um, they usually don't have public comment. There's usually some other changes um, to those meetings, but the agendas need to be posted. There's some legal requirements, um, one day instead of two. <laughs> um, and that's also why I generally recommend that we keep our routine business or items that have broad community um, interests to keep those on our regular and schedule. It's, it's a preference of yours. Okay. It's like, that is I'm, that, I'm available that day, so I'm not... That's, uh, that's also how it's traditionally been and the and she articulated it well and that um it keep it, they're they're meetings that need to be focused on a certain topic and then go ahead. so i'm good for the 22nd anytime after 1 30. Yeah. and my preference is afternoons just a preference and some people have told me not Wednesdays, Monday, Tuesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, different days, any of that information. Actually, I did have another question, and because Katie's been around longer than most of us, when we're scheduling meetings that are public meetings, are we attempting to meet the board's preferences or are we trying to entertain the public? Uh, not for input, maybe, if, if it's not an input uh, type meeting. Who are, we, who are we trying to accommodate? I, I would like to know that because if, if if homeschool mothers, you know, can only come in the afternoons, well, then we probably want to have more afternoon ones, maybe. But maybe other people that have a job in the afternoon want morning meetings. So, just so I understand, are we accommodating the board's convenience? Or are we trying to accommodate the public in some capacity? Can I, just say I don't. I don't. I don't so know how like, that. A lot of the time, it's we need to find space to meet, and so we tend to meet in the libraries, and so. We have a lot of programs that are scheduled in advance in most of our library meeting rooms. So it's like finding a set time that we can book out far in advance and keep that space for the library. So there's like space limitations where we're trying to host so the meetings. facility itself of having a place. It's part of it. Yes. That's that something we have to be mindful of. I would also say that the public has elected um, people. And so in order to be effective, law you know effectively run the library the most important thing is that the that the meetings are set up in such a way that the board can effectively operate and 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 so has that been afternoons i mean obviously we could have a meeting at seven o'clock at night I'm yes not asking for that but i'm just trying to understand who are we trying to accommodate when we're, when we're determining in, meeting schedule in the summer again i'm the rookie so that's why i'm asking in the summertime, we like last year, we neglected to move these summer meetings um, to the morning. And so like we were at Pinehurst or Harrison, which is like a 90, 75 minute drive. We were not getting done until six o'clock. And so we usually have the meetings from two to five. But when we are visiting these smaller libraries in the summer, we try to do them in the morning okay. because 
traveling really late and we have some people who don't have good eyesight. So normally it's two to five the summer. We tend to move in the morning, but that doesn't have to be that way if that's not what you want. Okay, okay so our time is up. So I would entertain a motion to extend the meeting by another 15 minutes. Do you guys know that we can? We have to. Yeah, we have uh, other stuff happening at one. So like we need to start take, tearing down as yeah. we can. Are we going to get some dates? So yeah, that's what I, would I kept like saying. Yeah. Make a motion that we have a special meeting on the 20th, the 19th, June 15th. It's close. What? On the 20th and the 22nd. The 22nd. I don't think we make motions for this. No. Yeah, I think well, I, I was proposing it. There's other things that we could just roll them into the meeting on the 22nd. Also, I believe. Right. I mean, in fact, Shell has already asked for a motion to extend the meeting. You have to deal with that right. before you can move on to anything else. I, I move that we extend this meeting by 10 minutes. Any discussion? Right. Uh, yeah, let's, let's, uh, the discussion for me is let's move because we've got to be out of here. These people have other things they need to get to. We have to get. Let's get moving. I, I, I extending it was off limits of what we could do. Yeah. Ten no, we can extend the meeting by 10 minutes. Uh, so the motion has been made to extend the meeting by 10 minutes. All those in favor? Aye. 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 What I would like to say is these these are proposed times that staff has looked at by adding one on the 20th that's two meetings a, a week that might be much there's definitely got to be a meeting on the 22nd which is a thursday and that is with the auditor and i'm assuming that there will be you'll be going over budget then then you've proposed special meetings for budget discussion on the 6th 13th 20th and the 25th each week you have proposed those so my suggestion is rather than switch it around can we look at these and see if these work for people. Well, my my concern is we need to get more done than waiting for budget till July. I think we need to do something, and, and I think the twenty uh, second is too busy. We'll be working on the budget at every meeting. That's not a special meeting. That's not much. Time. Okay, so Just Vanessa. <laughs> Uh, yeah, two o'clock on the twenty second is fine with me. Tom uh, said afternoon. Tim was it yeah. And Katie and I'm I might have been. I I am not able to attend. Okay. Right, 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 right. Okay. So two to five on twenty second. Okay. It should just take I an thought hour. That's just an hour. That's just um, But you know, I could post as an hour and a half to give us if in case people have questions. The auditor, it does have time constraints as well. So yeah, but okay. they want to have an additional topic on that. And so, some things on the on the agenda that can't wait until our regular meeting in mm -hmm. July. But the only thing I have a problem with that is that Katie won't be there. And so if we usually just do a focused meeting, um, and one trustee can't be there, I think it's important to take that in consideration. So, yeah, my my request is if you want another one, there's a, another week after. I would like to be at all meetings as possible. We have done our best throughout the years to make sure that we have to adjust our meeting times to make sure that the full board is here. Um, then if I would like to just have us all look at those July meetings, if you think that it's important that there's another meeting in June, there's also another week after the 22nd that's in, in June that a meeting could be planned. And after that, then there's a meeting a week throughout July. You know, um, so if if it's important to add another meeting, add it at, I, you know, I'm just going well, for those I, two I days. agree. June 29th, we, I think you should have two meetings in June. I don't like putting off everything until July. Yeah, I don't think. OK, if we, if we were going to have a second meeting on June 29th, it would need to be in the morning. Why? Uh, because I can't make anything. Else. Well, we have a vice chair over here. Mm -hmm. Well, they've also proposed at a time, so they've already looked at the. Meeting rooms, what's available. Uh, True, it does say nine to noon on yeah. for the, after the 29th. If they've already checked it out, it's good with that day. That's fine. I don't have any conflicts with any of these dates in my calendar except for one because I'm on jury duty, you know, a week in July. Well, couldn't we have a special meeting from, you know, 
9 to 11 or something like that on the 29th. Okay. Or 10 to 2, 10 to 10 to 12. Well, that's the 29th at what time? 9 to 11 or 10 to 12. I'm just, I am throwing out here because I'm just trying to get us out the door. I can't, I can't do anything um, until after 1130 on the 29th. 12 to 2. Uh, I can't make afternoon. Um, there's also the there's also that Friday if you are. Um, yeah, the week before is coming. Or the day after on the 30th. You want I'm at somebody, you know, a trustee is asking for an extra meeting and I'm just trying to put in some times and then. How about the 25th? That's a Sunday. Sorry, not Sunday. Okay. Um, what about um, looking at Friday, say one to three, the day after? That's with the thirtieth. Can't do anything on the thirtieth. Okay. What about the Friday of June twenty second that week? Um, it sounds like you have other agenda items that you want on, and rather than just the budget, but it it looks like that that week is really packed, unless you want to do Tuesday, on uh, the twenty seventh. Um, I could do the afternoon. Um, is this going to be a budget for a budget issue? I think we should get started on it. Frankly, I'm I'm concerned that we're waiting until July to start it, and we're supposed to all be done. What about the twenty second, twenty seventh from two to four? I'm open. I can do after three thirty on that day. Um, so that week is terrible i'm i don't need to be taking over this i'm just trying to get us moving all right yeah i just i figured 22nd and 29th we're both on the agenda for things for us to consider so i kind of assumed that those would be the dates that we would choose and those were just my thoughts as times based on when your meetings had been historically but we have new people and and it's a lot um i will say that i'm happy to sit down with each of you guys because you are a little bit behind what other people have done and so i can sit down and talk with you guys and janelle is an excellent resource too so if it's just because you know how much you've got to learn i'm happy to offer myself as a resource um i think having the audit finding because it's legally required that we focus on that and then yeah. we start the budget stuff so i was hoping to meet each of you one-on-one -on -one, and so i would just we can plan that in if that would maybe make a difference yeah oh, that would that be good you know that would be sort of training time that week and then we could look at the other special meet budget the, hearing the 29th here. is out though because can't make everybody yeah. I just want to get another meeting in in June well, yeah. why not get another meeting in July what's the difference it's just another July, meeting July 6 is about there it is because you got well, the fourth and all that yeah but just add in if you're so dead set on another meeting for the budget just add it to July there's another issue that needs to be discussed yeah. before July I, I think we need to meet I, I was willing to go June 20th I mean, that week I've got most of the time off or time available. What is the budget? What is the agenda item? Since it's a different item. Um, I want to talk about uh, some policies, try to make some changes possibly. I don't really want to keep waiting on that. Um, I think there's other things too. But I don't want to mix that with doing an audit and budgets. I, I I could get started on budget and could we okay, I'm I'm gonna be really um uh, just because of can we focus on our budget for the summer? We policies are typically what we begin to look at in September. We've done that before. We've had to do that before um with trustees. Do you guys remember when we put off programming policy? And, tell, and then we had a lot of time and we were able to. This budget is such a dramatic deal this year. It is really a big deal. And that it, we already have four meetings scheduled to look at the budget in July. To, to, to begin to tackle policies at the same time is going to be an incredible burnout. Could we, could, I, I'm we looking at something simple with policies, Katie. And I, and I, 
I, I, don't, like, I, I'm I not, like I don't have fit, that decision. I, I, was I would like to, I would like to fit another meeting in in June. And start, I'm concerned waiting till July 25th to get the budget figured out. I don't think you have enough time, but I really don't know the thought process. Okay, so it sounds like uh, we could either do a three hour meeting on June 22nd, um, or we could just do what, one and a half or a two hour meeting June 22nd, and the second one either on the 27th or the morning of June 29th. If it's about policies, I would really like the courtesy to be extended to me to be adjusted so that I can attend. This is the first meeting you've missed since I've been on the board. It's not like she really nearly doesn't show up to meetings. What about the 23rd? Yeah, what about that week of the, of the 22nd? What about the 20th, 21st, 23rd? Those are open. The 23rd. I'm open the 23rd. I, I am gone the, that Thursday and Friday. Okay, what about the 20th? That would be fine. I'm open. Anything after 2.30, I'm fine. You guys, you good? good? Okay, so 2.30 on the 20th. So I'll need the topics to put on the agenda to notice it. It'll be a special meeting and it'll be budget discussion. Or and then also room, what room would be open? I'll need to get in a location so that I can notice it. Okay. Part of it will be an executive session. Okay. What? What for? So it's, Why? What? It's usually executive we list, sessions. Usually we list the reasons or highlights. And you have to list the Idaho code that it pertains. Okay. Seventy four two zero six one A. What is that? Uh, hiring a new agent or something like that. Board hires the director. They don't hire or uh, engaging a new agent, something like that. So is it concerning hiring the director? No. It's concerning hiring a new attorney. Is that what it is? That what it is concerning hiring an attorney? Oh, pop up Alexa and do the agenda and. So I'll need a little bit more information about like how long the meeting is going to be. OK, can I move um, it afterwards? Because I think that was our time is up. You need to extend the meeting again if you're still talking. I move that we adjourn. I there, stuck in it. There's no, there's no discussion. OK, so yeah, there's no those two dates. There's um, no discussion to adjournment. Okay, uh, well, we have a motion to adjourn the meeting. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Sounds like this is unanimous. Uh, meeting is adjourned.